Jinbei. Thank you. Well, welcome to uh, Black History Conversations. We're well into our um, uh, Windrush recognition series now. Well, actually, this is probably the, the really the first one. We, we got started a little bit last week. But uh, I'm delighted that we've got uh, a group of wonderful guests here. But I'm going to start the session uh, this time. I'm not in Australia, so I'm going to start the session with asking um, Vivian Crawford. Vivian, would you like to say a prayer, please? Let us pray. Let us become still before God, who is our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. God, we know you are working with us, and we seek to work with you. And in this consciousness, we thank you for friends, for friends, for friends. You have appointed, you have designated to continue the work here on earth. And so we place this meeting into your hands. We seek guidance for our chair, Liz, and us who will participate, that all we do will be to your glory, as we remember in a special way your children, part of the Rindrush, and their generations, even those yet unborn. We remember those who have passed on to glory. And so as we place this meeting into your hands, we know that yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you very much indeed, Vivian. Now, um, we're aware of time very much at the moment, um, and we really need to get on with things. So I think maybe it would be best first to hear about what's been going on in Jamaica for this 75th anniversary of Windrush. Um, so I'm Liz Millman from Learning Links International. My colleague Simon Fring goes with us as well, organizing the behind the scenes things and he'll um, post the recording. Um, I think that's perhaps the best thing to do. Rudy, please tell us about what's been going on in Jamaica this week. 75 thank years after the Windrush sailed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I'm responsible for, for a program called the Windrush Anchor Heritage Education Program. Uh, and that, that program is a, it's kind of unique because it's community focused. But the the anchor that we we use to represent hope, strength, and belonging, uh, and the program activities are aligned with Jamaica's National Development Plan 2030 and the National Diaspora Policy, because they have shared goals, four shared goals of around the um, human potential, um, security and justice, prosperous economy, and a healthy environment. And then we, we've taken those goals and then we translated it in a program of activities. So those program of activities have some sort of key deliverables. So first of all, there's a set of values that underpins them. So we say the values of respect and, and inclusion are the common ground for all, regardless of background, culture or status and because our activities take place in the neighborhoods in the local communities we talk about inspiring inclusive peaceful caring and enterprising neighborhoods and local communities so that's about co-design co-production working together with communities at the core of it is a focus on young people so we say young people need somewhere to go. Young people need something to do. Young people need someone to show them how. So that's that's the broad conceptual framework of the program. And the, um, the key deliverables 
are around um, community empowerment, so I've kind of indicated it there, community mental health and well-being, creative clusters and new, new neurals, cultural heritage learning, digital media, educational exchange, envi environmental sustain sustainability, and festivals and fun days. And we aim to have a Windrush Heritage Museum here in Jamaica by 2030. And of course, <coughs> most importantly, uh, intergenerational storytelling and volunteering. So our first event was Labor Day. So in the morning at August Town Primary School, there was the beautification activities around the school and also the painting of August Town or repainting of August Town Police Station. And then in the afternoon, we then had a community festival. So this festival was called the Windrush Five Communities Anchor Festival in August Town. And why we say five communities, because there are five communities that make up August Town. So again, it's being sensitive to you know to the to the local communities and and what, once you focus on inc inclusion, so in this case, we adapted our program so that it, it was inclusive to all communities that make up all this town. And it was very successful. We had a great day, young people. We had a mark, sort of a march from the school down to the um, African Garden Square. There was a lot of rec recognition for people kind of work hard in the community who normally don't get recognized. We were in collaboration with uh, the, U the US diaspora as well. So it wasn't just the UK, there was collaboration going on there. And there was support from the local agencies being the, um, the community development committees, um, the S Social Development Commission, and the uh, Jamaica Social Investment Fund, University of West Indies, the Mona Social Services. We did all the filming and, and live streaming. So it's a combination of collaboration. And then Minister Favour Williams, who's the MP for the area, but she's also the education minister as well. And we've had schools from other parts of Jamaica, from Westmoreland and also from um, from St. Thomas as well. So it was a great day, that's the first day. Then our, our second day of activities, which uh, Mr. Vivian Crawford, we, we met there, I haven't seen him for many years. So, so that was a church service at the Anglican Church. That was, that was again, excellent, excellent service. And as we were talking about earlier on, the, the sermon, it's one of the best sermons that I've heard but the best speeches with such a great context and the reality of um, Windrush experience in the UK is really good. So I certainly recommend that to be shared to everybody. A lot of great information in there. And then in the afternoon, because the 24th now, so we, we take the 24th as departure day. So I should add as well, I'm on the National Committee for the Windrush celebrations in Jamaica as well. So I'm a member of that committee that has the, which is led by the National Library of Jamaica with representatives from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Culture, the Anglican Church, and some other, other stakeholders as well. So that's the, the body behind the activities. And there will be a traveling exhibition they have a, a kind of a pull-up exhibition that was, that was on display at the church. And that's going to go around the parish libraries around Jamaica over the next month. So they're kind of running this series up to, up to arrival day, basically. So what the strategy was, was the uh, start everything around the um, departure day and then run the activities across Jamaica to arrival day. And then, of course, in the UK, that will, will be very much the height of the celebrations. 
So in the afternoon, what we one of the things that I wanted to do was that um, we had a, 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 a small reception down at um, uh, a restaurant at Kingston Harbour. So in future, the departure day, we will, we will now call from next year Descendants Day. And this, we were having this discussion in terms of myself being a child of the Windrush generation. So my father came in 1955 from Highgate St. Mary, um, Harmony Hall, Highgate St. Mary. But the children of the Windrush generation, such as myself, we're now grandparents. So, um, so I see this as uh, passing the baton that we now putting on events in Jamaica and this year, you know, for the 75th year. So from next year now, our departure day will be very much about descendants. So what are we doing about the generations to come? And that's why we've aligned all our activities with Jamaica's 2030 National Development Plan and also incorporated the national diaspora policy because we work with the US diaspora and the Canadian diaspora as well. And, and maybe in the future, Liz, you could, you could consider having somebody on from Canada because during the 1970s and some of the those of us who grew up in the 1970s, there was, again, a, a change in the law. So some of the families who were, who were, who were coming up in the 70s, in fact, had to go to Canada because it, there were some restrictions. Because I remember growing up having friends who said, oh, you know, my brother's in Canada because, you know, they couldn't come to the UK. So we we started dialogues with the Canadian diaspora and to find people who that had happened. And we've got some colleagues here, one of my colleagues. In fact, that happened to her family as well. So in terms of Velma, what we were speaking about, there's another context to this you know those families that were split in that way as well so it really is not we haven't really scratched the surface yet on this wind rush when we think of the descendants and you know where everybody's gone so um so right so so yeah so from next year we, we will be talking descendants then and then yesterday now we had a, a panel discussion um, so the Minister Kamina Johnson was there and um, the new State Minister for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And that, that was a lively discussion, I'll put it that way. And um, again, it was good that it took place because it, it was very much about there's the academic view of Windrush and then there's the, the lived experience view of, 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 of Windrush. And there was, you know, quest Q and A as well, and and I think also, and we know there is a challenge between the the scandal on the one side and celebration and commemoration on the other side, but there's a common ground. There's a common ground because we need both. So so yeah, so so that was brought here the activities the last three or four days. So overall, I've been I've been pleased. I mean, I would say if we were to add up the people who've been involved overall, it must be at least a thousand people to take all the events and activities over the last few days. So, and again, I think it's put down a good marker here in Jamaica for Windrush. We certainly need more people who've got the lived experience to come and get involved in Jamaica because it would help the context. And, and I, I did challenge the academics on the discussion panel about providing much more clarity and definition. And actually, again, hearing more hearing more stories and get a better understanding of, of the lived experience, particularly in the UK. And we've also got to think about those who've come back to Jamaica as well. And hence our, pro, our theme is hope, strength and belonging. Because there's no reason why you shouldn't feel that you belong in the UK as well as Jamaica. It's your choice. You, you should be able to, you know, get back to the values of respect and inclusion. So we've got some interesting discussions ahead. 
And I know Velma will be quite a good person for that as well. So I'll, I'll stop there. I can take any questions. Let me just uh, share this then that you yeah. sent to me, which is to um, just uh, show the calendar of activities again. Um, that was really great, Rudy. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, so we started on Tuesday, which was Labor Day, with the Winter's Five Communities Anchor Festival. And that was in um, the African Gardens in August Town. And then the next day you had the National Church Service. And that afternoon you also had another reception, did you say? Uh, yeah, yeah. Then. And um, then the 25th was the the panel discussion. I do hope some of these things have been filmed and we'll yeah. see what went every, on. Every, yeah, everything that there's a film for all. So I'll share that as soon as we get it. Wonderful. And then um, the Windrush Travelling Exhibition, which is during the time that the Windrush was sailing, well, perhaps a little little later from departure, um, the Travelling Exhibition. So that that's just fabulous. And in a way, we're uh, travelling Black History Conversations because we're travelling each week to, to talk about what was happening with about Windrush during that that period of time. So I'm just going to ask you one quick favour, Rudy. Can you just move to what to move to this side? No, the other side. Yes. Good. So I want everybody to be able to see this lovely um uh let me just you'll have to speak so I can see it big. Uh, the anchor. Just, the anchor. There we are, Windrush seventy five Passing the Baton, 2023, oh, the a united yeah, family at home and abroad. Isn't yeah. that just beautiful? I'm just going to yeah. take a screenshot of that. Hold your horses, folks. Thank you very much indeed. That's really, a, really lovely. Thank you. Okay, and there's a quick so, story. There's a quick story around the anchor. Yeah? So the Windrush ship itself is at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. Mm -hmm. And there's a big project led uh, by Patrick Vernon, and Max Holloway and the David Burns to raise the actual anchor itself and bring it back to the UK. A big half a million pound fundraising program. And Greenwich Council commissioned an artist to actually produce an exact replica of the anchor in terms of its size and everything. And basically nobody wanted it. So so when it, so when Max said, well nobody you know who wants it so i said i'll have it and i just built the program of activities around the anchor because of what it symbolized you know for two thousand years the anchor there's great stories and the metaphor of an anchor so you know we use hope strength and belonging as the three key key words around around the anchor but uh, great songs you know will your anchor hold through the storms of life there's some great hymns around the anchor of course so and and so by having that around uh, communities, it's been really effective, and it will actually be at a Southwark Cathedral on the twenty second of June. So there is a march, and that's led by the uh, churches together, uh, Britain and Ireland. So there's going to be like a march from the memorial at Waterloo down to Southwark Cathedral. So they're going to actually have a um, sort of floral representation of the anchor to carry it down. How oh, brilliant. Oh, nice. Are we going to so, start with questions and you need to introduce yourself because we didn't do the introductions earlier because I know you're tight on time, Rudy. So, Parker, <laughs> would you like to introduce yourself and ask your question? Ah, uh, yeah, good afternoon. The name is Kwaku. I work around what I call British African history. So that's global African history. That includes Windrush, of which I have a particular interest, the early Windrush years uh, in terms of the deep history about that. Anyway, my question to Ruth is that you introduced yourself, I think, as being a chair or something to do with the uh, the anchor. And then you mentioned Patrick uh, Vernon. I know Patrick Vernon and co uh, have their project to uh, get the anchor uh, back.
back from the deep sea. So this organization of which you are the chair, is that Patrick Vernon's and co, are they involved in it or is it a separate organization to what Patrick Vernon and co are doing? It, it, my organization making connections work is separate, but um, how I got involved is because I run a number of platforms, as you know, on a radio station, Fresh FM Radio London. I, I in the orig originally, I was just supporting and helping to amplify the message because I thought it was a great idea in itself to raise the anchor. And as I kind of alluded to, just by chance, the replica became available. Nobody wanted it. And I could see the importance of the symbolism of the anchor as it related, not just to the Windrush communities, but the wider communities. Because we have lots of young people uh, who are in our neighbourhoods, in our communities, we want harmony, but they've all got their stories to tell. So the, you know, which is the Caribbean way is to be inclusive and hear everyone's stories, basically. But these people will hear our story. Right. So the clarity I wanted was that you are now doing your independent project with the anchor, as opposed to what Patrick Vernon and Co are doing. Yeah, we collaborate. We work very closely together. Okay. Yeah, ever since since last year. So this is not just started this year. If you go, you can go to the, my website, making connections work slash forward slash winds uh, windrush anchor. It has all the information, the powerpoints right from the very beginning. Well, when Patrick and myself actually collected the, the cardboard anchor together, and you know we've gone off and did, we've done all that stuff. You'll see all the events that we've done. Done loads of events since last year. Rudy, do you mind just giving me that um that uh email? Sorry, yes. Yeah, so makingconnectionswork.com slash windrush anchor. Right. And here's one last quick point. So what we did as well, because I believe in community economic development because of my regeneration background, um, we, 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 for the festival, we got a local carpentry, carpenters to actually, to actually to make a smaller version of, of an anchor. And so you see that in all the pictures. And we're now going to have them make anchors for the 775 communities that make up Jamaica, which is the 2024 agenda. And that's how you, you become part of the Windrush Anchor program in Jamaica. You have one of these wooden anchors. And what we said to them, we're also viewing this as a community apprenticeship so that they will take on a young person to learn the skills of carpentry. And they'll be making the anchor. So, so we kind of launched that as well. So I'm really pleased with that. That's a beautiful uh, idea and a, a great plan. Um, and I'm sure the community that we're working with in Penance, Jamaica, and we've got Ivor Johnson yeah. with us from Penance in Jamaica. I'm sure he'll be really keen to take that one up with you. Yeah. That's brilliant. And Kwaku, thank you very much for joining us from Ghana. And please stay with us for as long as you can. And um, that was absolutely ex good question, Kwaku, good points. Yeah. Right, Thanks, verification. So I'm just um, aware on the screen at the moment, I can see some lovely, lovely names and welcome to you all. I'm going to come to you, Vivian, in a moment, but just to say that uh, Garrick Clayog's with us. Garrick um, often takes a big part in a lead on these black um, history conversations. So it's good to see you, Garrick, from Justice for Windrush Generations, as is Roland Huslin and also June Elizabeth White Smith Gully, who's joined us and is also they're also part of the Windrush Allies Network, Windrush International Allies Network. So good to see you, June Elizabeth. Good to see you, Garrick and Roland. I know you're listening in. So thank you very much, Rudy. Vivian, would you like to um make the next point? Um unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for waiting. And thank you very much, Liz. Flawless chairman. And a corollary to Rudy's um, excellent, outstanding presentation and to thank him most sincerely for such a fantastic overview. Of course, I have a 
special interest in the service which was held at the Kingston Parish Church. Because, and we should note that the church was established shortly after the earthquake of Port Royal, 1692. So it, that church is where 1702 um, Admiral Benbow defended, his, his remains are in that church. He defended Jamaica from the French. And here we are not speaking French today. But to say that at the service which was held last Wednesday, for the first time in the history of our country, all the music except one, all the music, they were written by Jamaicans. I, 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 we, I was overcome. The, the only, the, 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 well, the, organ, the opening voluntary by the organist Dwight McBean, who was trained in England, all over, trained Westminster Abbey too. He did, perhaps rightly so, a piece by Purcell, trumpet voluntary. Fair enough. But all the hymns, all the hymns. Now, the final hymn was written by a Trinidadian um, for the 1976 Conference of Churches, Caribbean Churches in Jamaica. But the music was written by our own Noel Dexter. So everything. Jai is my keeper was the psalm. And that psalm, written by Peter Tosh, was sung at Canterbury Cathedral in 2019 for the consecration of Bishop Rose Hudson Wilkin at Jamaica. So at that service, that service, it was so special for me. And secondly, the first time I was hearing applause from an Archbishop's sermon. And I'm told it's the second time that was taking place in West in, in um, Kingston Parish Church because in the 1970s, a former bishop, after his sermon, um, he was applauded. But Bishop Gregory, on Wednesday, it was, a, as, as Rudy said, it was a really balanced presentation because he spoke of the challenges that our people had in England. But also, he pointed out, sadly, that when they returned home, some of them for good, some of them for holidays, the welcome, they were abused, robbed, etc. And I just thought that his presentation being so balanced, I wasn't surprised that there was spontaneous applause. And to thank Ruddy most sincerely for what he's doing in Jamaica. And I'm glad, Ruddy, that you selected August Town because August Town was named after, um, it was in August, 1838, that our ancestors were set free. And beside it is the Hope River, where Major Hope came with Penn and Venables in 1655, and the river is named after him. But there was a Jamaican prophet named Bedward. It was the stream that he used from that, that river, the water from that river, as a healing point. And the colonials, they couldn't get rid of him. He was mobilizing more people than any politician. And in order to condemn him, they declared that he was insane. And he died in, uh, in an asylum. So you're going to August Town. It was a revival for me personally. And to thank you most sincerely for being so insightful. Thank you. Thank you for that. Liz, can I just quickly say, uh, again, this will resonate with um, Vivian, is that in 2020, I decided my future projects in Jamaica will start with the three most spiritual leaders that I could think of. So Bedwood, Bogle, Sharp. So next year, our big focus is on Bogle, and uh, Grants Penn Primary School will be the school that we do our, our particular Labor Day activities, but we'll be supporting other schools around Jamaica and other projects as well. And the, that area was the old Albion estate. So Mezga Gardens, where we have a family interest. And workers from Albion actually marched to support Paul Bogle when they were, you know, on the march to the courthouse. 
So again, that great historical context, right? So that, that's that's going to be the center of activities next year, this time next year. Well, that's fantastic. Absolutely wonderful. Um, now I'm going to ask Garrick to, to come in next, please, Garrick. Um, first of all, thanks very much, Rudy, for um, giving us the insight into the last couple of days. Uh, the Gleaner did cover this story well, and uh, I've got it in front of me. Um, and um, just picking up a couple of points, um, Vivian has made some reference to the uh, historic um, information. And it's important that when we're having the, these conversation, and you know, it, we're having conversation about Windrush and the diaspora, but it's a bigger conversation. It's a conversation about African history. It's a conversation about British history. It's a conversation about politics. It's a conversation, you know, much wider. And on this platform, Black History Conversation, each week we emphasize the point that we need to move into different spaces with these conversations. Because the generation um, that's coming up, and you referred to, um, you know, uh, younger people, etc. <clears throat> and those generations coming up, which will be the next generation when we depart from, from, from this place, they need to have the understanding and the knowledge about you know, the past. And this is where Sankova comes in, looking back and looking forward. Okay. Okay. So it's important each time we have these conversations, we widen those conversations to include, yeah, it's not a narrow Jamaican history. It's not a narrow um, African um, diaspora. You know, we need to make sure that these conversation move into a global space. And when we get the opportunity to do so, let's do that. And you made a, a point about the academics in Jamaica. Um, and, you know, from their perspective, they like the timeline and, and the historic context. But as you have you said about the live experience, and, you know, we had a conversation with Professor Martin Livermore before he departed, the day before. And we had a conversation with him that when he's out there, there are some specifics that we want to try and, 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 and uh, uh, um, uh, address. And so when he come back and when you return, I'm sure there will be more conversation to be had in terms of on the ground with those communities. Because, you know, Roland and myself, we're interested in people who've been removed from the UK. Yeah, what is their life experience in Jamaica yeah, at this time? Are they getting any support from the government? You know, these are the issues that we raise with Professor Martin Livermore. And we've also been able to pick up stories on the ground where individual is reaching out to people outside Jamaica for help because there is no help there. So I, I guess yeah. that, you know, these conversations after the Windrush, and of course the Windrush 75, it continues all the way through um, August. Uh, and I hope beyond that. Um, but I want to make sure that in Jamaica, we're having those conversations in different places. Yeah, Garrick, it's such a great point Garrick has made, Liz, very quickly. One of the things I ensured at the August Town Festival that um, Martin Livermore would have time to speak and tell everybody what he was doing as it related to the Home Office in Jamaica and Windrush. Because very quickly, Liz, I was I was involved in helping to get information, advice, and guidance from 2018 when the scandal first broke, using Church of God of Prophecy, all our churches and all our conventions across the country for a couple of years, in fact. So I, I I'm in tune on that side of 
the wind last. So I made sure that uh, Martin had time. And then also tomorrow, if you tune in to Durban Malcolm show, you know the diaspora live. I arranged for Martin to speak on his show as well. Again, because I'm clear that, and this is the other reason why we're dealing with all communities in Jamaica, because we want to hear the voices of those who have ended back in Jamaica. And what, what are their support needs? Again, we're back to that lived experience. So I'm glad you raised that. So that's an integral part of our of our program. It could ne it could never be missing. And, and again, it comes under the hope, strength, and belonging. You know. Yeah. You're on mute, Liz. Thank you very much indeed, Rudy. Very valuable and very valuable indeed, Gary. Um, uh, Makapi, are you able to comment? Makapi is joining us from Tanzania, and Makapi is going to speak in one of the conversations in a few couple of weeks' time um, about his, the research he's done of the lived experience of his family, um, where he was um, uh, he was the first child born of his parents in Birmingham. And then his older brothers and sisters came over to Birmingham and he has younger brothers and sisters as well. So he's done some research. Makapi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Liz. Greetings, Ooh. everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Makapi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know what it is, but it seems like every time I come on, uh, music gets blasted in the background. Um, so last time I was at the beach and I was trying to get a quiet spot. But anyway, um, yeah, greetings to each and every one. Makapi Selassie, Tanzania. Um, what I've heard is is really brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Because um, yes, Windrush 75. But if you ask people generally about Windrush and 75, you know, Windrush means 75 years. They most probably scratch their heads and say what way you know what I mean so it's to get it out there amongst our community and globally our community meaning in England and globally about the windrush yeah so um as Rudy said is a child of the windrush I put it another way I said that I'm a windrush picnic right so everyone's narrative needs to be told so the windrush generation narrative story needs to be told and the windrush picnic them story need to be told also mm -hmm. you know so it's like that and also coming from rastafari perspective you, you mentioned um hope strength and belonging yeah and i think that the windrush picnic them story is really about longing and belonging you know what i mean so belonging, do I do I and I or do we belong in England? Do we belong in Jamaica? Or do we belong in Africa? So it's a it's a sense of longing in the in the search of an identity and then belonging. Where do I and I belong? And I leave it here until I get to present. But yeah, a windrush picnic. I am a windrush picnic. Me a windrush picnic here, sir. And that's it. Over and over. Makapi Selassie, Windrush Rasta Pigney Dem. <laughs> Makapi, you are just so uh, perceptive and your, your poetry is also fantastic. So we look forward to the session that you're going to join us in and tell us. And that heading, Longing and Belonging, is a fantastic, yeah. fantastic line there isn't it thanks ever so much Makabi, for joining us all the way from tanzania and if you're still on the beach today just enjoy the music okay right roland i can see you this is an unusual event let's see what the sounds like roland hoslin from justice for windrush generations roland can you unmute yourself roland and speak to us yeah yeah no, yeah i'm on Okay. Any comments, Roland? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, Any that comments? sounds good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
It's a bit difficult to hear you, Roland. Can you stand still just for a minute? The sound is going in and out. It's going in and out. Yeah. Can you hear me better now? Yes, thank you, Roland. Yeah, so yeah, I'm glad to hear the hear the work that Rudy is doing in Jamaica. Well, following on from what Garrick said, hopefully when Professor Livermore comes back, return to the UK, we can develop the conversation, pick up from where we left off before you went down and get a better understanding of what he gathered when he went down there. I'm uh, referred a number of people to him and hopefully they can feed information to him as to what they know about the scheme I do not know about speed. I'm at a conference at the moment. I'm trying to push the Windrush agenda as much as possible. And the networking, I've met a number of interesting individuals and networking with a number of organizations. So, but I'm going to leave it there for now because I'm trying to engage as much as possible. Okay, but I'm here, I'm listening, I'm watching and listening. I'll okay. back to you at the point later. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, thank you, Roland. That's really good and brilliant work you're doing on behalf of Justice for Windows. Um, Velma, I uh, would like to ask a question or make a point to you, Rudy, before you have to go. So is that all okay. right, Velma? No problem. Yes. Rudy, my brother, you mentioned the Hope River and that sense of hope. You've mentioned belonging and bedwet, of course, which you know it's a bit of not quite a pet subject. So here we are, Hope Leaves Jamaica. This is the Windrush book in Wandsworth people, 1998, and in Hackney, all the schools and library, 2004. Birds in the wilderness, because remember Hope, the Hope River, Birds in the Wilderness, the ch set in Battersea, that's Battersea Power Station, when yeah. the children come to England. That's not what I want to talk about. I wanted to pick up the Hope River so yeah. that you see how we use the word hope and that yeah. sense of belonging. So this is unbelonging. However, Bedward. So Vivian is here and who else will remember growing up in Jamaica, we all in the countryside knew about Bedward all over Jamaica. Yeah. And of course, there's the song, Vivian, dip them, them bed, Bedward, dip them, them, dip them in the healing stream. stream. Brother Bedward, you remember? Dip them, Bedward, dip them, dip them in dip the healing stream. stream. Oh. Some <laughs> come from the east, like them big leg of the east, we got the Kimina, the healing stream. Some come from the north with the mouth full of rot, we got the Pina, the healing stream. There you go. I had to sing that for you just a bit. I'm, right. I'm going to get you to sing that again now. Um, I would have to practice it, it <laughs> because I'll write it out and then yeah. remember it. Because as children, we used to sing it yeah. and then the adults because I went to Baptist church and school. So of course it was, you couldn't really sing it in front of adults, but we loved it. And so we all know about Bedward as um, Vivian um, said, and Bedward will be in um, volume two because the next book will reach. So I just want to get that because I know you said you had half an hour. So in the next volume, we will reach 1912 by the next volume and you will hear about Bedward and the song and all the people as well. So thank you for that. Yeah. And of course, there's that great book by Dr. Mar Maria Smith Robinson, where she meant on revivalism in Jamaica. And of course, yeah. Um, oh, yes, yeah. yes. Were we on the podcast together? Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yes. So quickly before I go, Liz, uh, I, yeah. I forgot to mention very important. There's also a donation drive. So this is great for people like Velma. 
So again, calling all Windrush Generation authors and creatives. Mm-hmm. And this is to submit their work, books, digital images, printed materials, audiovisual footage, manuscripts, mm-hmm. photographs, prints and drawings, all related to, to Windrush to be mm-hmm. submitted to the National Library of Jamaica. Again, I think that that's great because it, again, it's all it's the story, regular. all the perspectives, even mm-hmm. the work that you know Gary and Roland are doing, because we produce a lot of documents related yes. to this. Lots of meetings are being held. You know that we've now got lots of recorded content. So mm-hmm. in years to come, this is going to be valuable in two, three generations' time. Yes, these dialogues, and of course, those of us who read, you know, like hundred and two hundred years ago, you know, documents and manuscripts know how important they they just look like ordinary meetings at the time and people said oh you know are you going to that meeting yes there was only three people there Mm -hmm. but look at the information of some of these meetings you know so i i see i see this is really great for us Mm -hmm. yeah to make them for the library to be doing something like this uh, i i just want to add that this book is at the national library in jamaica and also, is it the Institute? Vivian, hence I was searching for you, the African Caribbean. African They've Caribbean written, Institute of Jamaica. Yes, Jamaica they wrote to me this week and the National Library as well. And it's yeah. a wonderful letter as an invaluable contribution for researchers in the future. Also, no, it, it, it's a great resource. All those books that you've done, you will see, or, or we may not see, but we know in one or two generations' time, are going to be of great significance to people who will read them and help them in that context. One quick last point, Vivian, maybe you could help. I also had uh, um, Jamaica National Heritage Trust contact me, and they were very interested in what we're doing. So um, that, again, is broadening the perspectives around the Windrush activities, because they're... Yeah. They're also yeah. looking at what's going on in the UK to come back to Jamaica around exhibition, I guess. Mm-hmm. Well, well, Rudy, that's a good point. Vivian? Yes, thank you very much. Yes. Um, who is this? Garrick, who spoke earlier, who oh, I'm so glad, Garrick, you did, about the connections, because quite a lot of our heritage, as Liz will t- tell you I said last time it's under the carpet and Liz um, I reflected the whole weekend on what you said and I just thank you for your magnanimity because you said you grew up with silver cutlery (laughs) and glass you know glass yes and I when, when, when she said it I said um, she would not have been taught or even aware that the DNA of what you were benefiting from came from persons who were regarded as half human and half animal. <laughs> and this is why I get so emotional yeah. when I know that we are now from under the carpet and we can tell our story. And I really must thank Liz for her magnanimity, generosity. She reminds me of Sir Thomas Fowell Buxton and Wilberforce. I am sure they are family. They are your families. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't have said Buxton. <laughs> well, let, let me tell you something else, Vivian, about history under the carpet. I'm in a place called Macclesfield at the moment, and one of our mm-hmm. colleagues who's joined Black History Conversations from time to time, Caroline Sansom, is getting married tomorrow, so we're all here for the wedding. So, um, But we drove through a very affluent little community here in Cheshire, which is just on the outskirts of Liverpool, called Nutsford. Yeah. yeah. Does it sound a bit familiar? Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. First racing course. Kingston called Nutsford yeah. Boulevard. Nutsford Boulevard, yes. Boulevard. Um, That's the yes. Express. <laughs> Emancipation <laughs> Park. No. Yes. 
So we need to explore that under the carpet story. Exactly. But thank you. Thank you for saying that, Vivian, about my, my family history. I've done a little bit more research. It's one of my projects while I'm here because, as I said, I just took it for granted that everybody had silver biscuit barrels. <laughs> <laughs> we had a lot of money, but we had a silver biscuit barrel, you know. Like... That's me. We, we had a paraffin lamp, me and my mother in one room. Yes. Oh, yes. dear. But so, can I just say that Buxton is free is in Saint Anne, and uh, uh, Pastor, I'll invite him onto um, this pro. I call it program for now, Liz. Um, yeah, yeah. Preach there because um, he's part of the Jamaica Baptist Association. So he has retired, but he preached at Buxton recently. And there's an exhibition at the Museum of London Docklands about the Indo-Caribbean experience. I went there this week. Here is, you can't see it, Thomas Buxton's table where they sat. So I will try and send it to you, Liz, and then you can share it. And Rudy, I'll send it to you. Yeah, that's right. But you'll be back so you can I've go been, to. Sorry, uh, if oh. it, is it Sir Thomas Fowell Buxton? Yes. Is it Sir yes. Thomas Paul Boxton? Yes, Boxton. Yeah, Thomas. Yes, it's here. It's I, written up. I would beg, I would beg, I would beg, I would beg for an image to be sent to the Michael College because he I, was the chairman of the Lady Michael Trust from which well, I am a beneficiary. Right. Okay, okay. What I'll do is, because the exhibition, I felt that I hadn't really taken in enough. So I sent a message to someone today that I'm going to go back. So then I can take a better photo because I was just taken for the sake and then let you have it. But let me stop talking for now. And fortuitously, I quoted Sir Thomas Fowell Boxton yesterday. I know. That I famous know. letter that he wrote. <laughs> Liz, this is absolutely my last point, and I have to run. Okay, your last point, then, and we'll then thank you, and then Gary. It's such, a, it's such a great conversation, but just to just to and it builds on something that Gary said. Now, in Jamaica, there are seven hundred and seventy-five communities across the island. So we had already worked out for next year. We'll be working on the three counties. So we. You know, we've divided, you know, follow the historic line. And and what we've said anyway was that every one of those communities had somebody who's come to the, you know, who've left there, come over to whether it's the UK, US or Canada. And just thinking about what Garrett said, there's nothing, it's not difficult for us to use our communication system to find out then across these communities well, is there anybody who needs some support? So the point that you make, Gary, it's a really important, great point. So I'll start to think about how we do that because, you know, I'm in touch with so many people now with this programme. So thanks for that point. That's wonderful. I'm just going to see if Ivor's listening. Ivor from Penance, Jamaica. Ivor, are you there at the moment? Yes, I'm here, Liz. Listening to all the information, yes. Learning so much, yes. Good. Okay. Yeah. Um, because I'm sure your community in Penance would be a community that would be very interested in this anchor. And then yeah. we'll also tell Rudy at some stage about the other interesting stories of Robert Rumble and yeah. the tenant strike. Mm -hmm. Very good story. Yeah. And, I'm, and I'm happy to come back round about July time, because then I would have set out what we're doing in 2024 by about July, because the aim is to get next month out of the way, and then in July, set out the agenda for 2024. So I'm happy to come back and it. Thank you very much indeed. I thought you know that. down there. Thank you. Now, um, we've got Garrick next and then June, I think. But thank you. If you, as and when you need to go, Rudy, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you ever so much for your... Okay. I'll just hear well, these last done, well done, well done for all you're doing over there. Thank Wish you. I was there. <laughs> I, I'm just going to pick up a small point because you know it just it just demonstrate what uh, um 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 has just said and um the spin-off to what velma said you know uh, this conversation so literally we're not having black history conversation we're talking about you know cheshire and british history and everything else you know and and you know it just illustrate that we we do not restrict our conversation 
uh, just around black history. And just one final point, Liz, um, the project um, for schools that we haven't yet got off the ground for the, the is it the tide? Um, that is a that is a great opportunity for the engagement, picking up what Rudy has said to ensure, uh, you know, school primary, secondary, and um, you know, further up to up to university, university level. And we in need to Wales. kick we need to kickstart that as soon as possible. In Wales, in Wales, in Wales, yeah, yeah, very good initiative that one. So June, I'll just listen to Judith's point, then I'll I'll go. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Excuse me being late. I, I've been having problems getting on. So I missed the beginning of you, Rudy. I live in Northampton and I was the first Winrush girl born of Jamaican parents. So we have a rich pioneering Jamaican history in Northampton. And I do believe, you know, being part of the Winrush International Allied Network, which we're all on at the moment, um, there can be a great coordination. I mean, when Velma spoke the last time, I tried to order my book before she finished. Um, what I'm <laughs> saying is like maybe about 15 years ago, 20 years ago, in Northampton, we've got the Northampton Black History Association, but we've now got the Windrush Generation and Descendants UK. And we have lodged over 200 interview, oral interviews, and they are of different nationalities, a lot of Jamaicans, half of them are Jamaicans. Some of them are no longer with us. And now we find that a lot of people are now trying to take oral histories. Yeah, so we got a template. And I, I think what we're doing at the moment, we've got contemporary arts, digitalizing them so it would be nice to when I go in the archive to pull out a few different Jamaicans from all the different from some of them will belong to some of the 775 communities yes and kind of do some kind of international work and I'm also now at the University of Northampton doing my MA in history the emotions in history. So I'll just close by saying, not echoing, but saying what has been said about working together. And as I said to um, Liz, with my emotions in history, it's like from the Middle Ages right to current. So I did a podcast for my part of my assignment and it was on compassion, right? In this MA studies, there's nothing really about black people, right? Mm -hmm. So what I they said to me, because I'm a black researcher, they said they would like me to support them getting some diversity. And I mean, it's a bit sad, but never mind. So what I did in Compassion, I spoke about, you know, the nursing, the church and the nursing, the monks and Florence Nightingale is my idol until I knew Mary Seacole, who I'm a member of Mary Seacole Memorial. In fact, two weeks ago, I was at the, was it last week? I was at the wreath laying service. And then from, from Mary Seacole, what I did when I began my podcast, I said there, I'm going to talk about four people, Florence Nightingale, Mary Seacole, and two Jamaicans that were born under the colonial. And I, I said, Clifford Gully, that's my husband, he was born in 1938, and Robert Rumble, right? So one of the um, French uh, French historians, he kind of had a special um, communication with 1938. So I use that because that was the year when Jamaica had a bit of strikes and things going on. So my husband's in the podcast with me, and then I could bring... Robert Rumble in. They never acknowledged Robert Rumble, so I'm going to have to lift it up because I said I brought Robert Rumble in because 
he knew he might got, got, get into trouble. He went to prison for the Poor People's Association, and yet he had so much compassion that nobody really talks about Robert Rumble. So I brought him up into the University of Northampton and highlighting him. And that's what I'm going to do when I do my dissertation. That will be part of it. So all together, I think we can really do something. Well, we are doing something, just being here. And Kaku, nice to see you as well. OK, I'll just close there, you know. But thank that, you very that, much for your input. Thank you. And, and um, just very quickly, once again, before I absolutely do go, is that what you're saying, June, is excellent for a couple of reasons. One, um, the first one, that's why I've included community mental health and well-being as part of this because of the impact on mental health. So I, I work in the NHS and the system and organisational development side. And I've set up forums for the NHS and stuff like that. And that word compassion, because particularly around mental health, because we use the term we use that in order to get the best outcomes, it's to treat people with love, compassion, and with humanity. Because that that is not what happened after the Mental Health Act in 1959, post the, the Notting Hill riots. A lot of people don't understand. And then Garrett would know this, and then the 70s, particularly, and into the 80s, there was this harshness in terms of our, our, our young men, particularly being taken into the mental health system and compulsion when it came to, uh, you know, um, medication, that, that made them worse. We've got the spinning, you know, the revolving door. And the, the, there's the Mental Health Review Act going on now, and that's about reducing compulsion. And that's an important part as it relates to the Windrush generation. And we're starting to look at how we can do some comparative studies now between Caribbean people in the UK and Caribbean people in the Caribbean, but particularly in Jamaica, especially when we're young people, because our third generation now and our fourth generation now are entering the mental health system with all kinds of challenges. Um, so I've, I've been in touch with a psychologist in Jamaica. And just finally, I'm glad you mentioned Mary Seacole because I was the project manager for the bicentenary celebrations for Mary Seacole on behalf of Guys in St. Thomas. And in fact, I was responsible for ensuring the first Mary Seacole exhibition that was held in the Florence 90 Yale Museum in London. I was a project manager and made sure that happened. And that and all of that work that I did that year, which included helping youngsters from the Caribbean Nurses Organization to spend a week in their different disciplines within Guys and St. Thomas Hospital, as well as looking at the heritage of Mary Tifo, but also the again, the lived experience of Caribbean nurses in this country. And that that was delivered by um Sarah Mulally, at the time she was the chief nursing officer, and of course she's the first Bishop of London. And Vivian will know that back 200 years ago, if you were in this country and of African origin and you wanted freedom because you landed in here, you had to go to the Bishop of London. So it's, the whole historical ties is amazing. And, I, and I've, put, I've put the the actual case study for Mary Seacole in the group. This year is the 218th anniversary of the, the birth of Mary Seacole. And again, I mentioned yesterday at the discussion panel, I can't understand why Jamaica does not celebrate Mary Seacole over Florence Nightingale. And I was right. told by the Nursing Association of Jamaica that were not interested. I'm a member of I'm a member of the Nursing Association no, of I'm Jamaica. Talking about in Jamaica, in Jamaica, not, in I'm not talking about England. the UK. Yeah. Yeah. I know everybody in the UK. I'm talking about my thing is in Jamaica because that's so Yes, I know, but you don't know me and I'm a part of Jamaica. Okay. okay. We're going to carry on this wonderful discussion. Yes. Like nice this. to meet Ruby. you. Um, yes. yeah. Ruby. Thank you. So just before you go. Um, Never mind I about live, just before you go, I live, Elizabeth. I live, we need I to move on. In, sorry. I did live in London at that time because I trained at St Thomas's. I'm an ex-police officer as well. And you know, Mr. Haven, he was a 
Jamaican a psychologist, yeah. psychiatrist. We're going to have to continue this yeah. conversation. Okay, he opened our Thank centre so for the mental health in you. Northampton. Yeah. Okay. I'll Good afternoon, time. Elizabeth. Thank you, Rudy. Excellent and wonderful. And if we don't get on, we're going to lose the opportunity of hearing from Mel Velma McClymont, the author of this fantastic and quite thick book um, called Little River, the first of a trilogy. Um, and I have a copy in my hand, which I'm delighted to say, because I'm now in the, back in the UK. I've been able to start reading. I haven't got very far yet, Velma, because I'm not very very good at reading lots of thick books, but I'm going to get all the way through it. And I found the first part of it absolutely fascinating. So Velma, over to you, please, to tell us about how you came to write this incredible book after having written some other great books beforehand. Thanks okay. so much, Velma. Thank you thank for your patience. Thank you for having me, Liz, and thank you to everybody on the platform. I would love to stay um, for as long as possible, but it's my grandson's birthday. So I said to my husband, well, I'm going on at 2.30. I promise you I'll be off by four. So he said, OK, I will take him out, you know, to the park, wherever. But you've got to be ready for 4.30 because my daughter is coming with the cake cut a long story short so let me get going as liz i've mentioned before there are other books four books this was book of the year birds in the wilderness so it should be in jamaica in 1998 so you know i really have actually been working in terms of windrush since 1998 many people over here have said oh she's jumping on the windrush bandwagon I was doing this work um, 1998 till now is what, 20, about 24 years, 25, you know, so it's eight, eight and four, 12, 13, yes, 25 years. So I have been around a long time, but been published for 30 years. And you heard Hope Leaves Jamaica um, as such. Anyway, we are going on to this. Having um, worked as a children's writer in the past and then later researcher academic which which i think i mentioned the last time i was on the platform um my phd thesis was really looking at british women writers in the caribbean the early west indies as we said west indies prior to independence so what has resulted is 1999 to 2022. So the research in this book is the University of the West Indies up in Mo Mona, University Cave Hill, Barbados, St. Lucia, Rodney Bay, Pigeon Island, you name it, New York, the African Burial Ground Monument, if you remember me saying, Scotland, I've spent a lot of time in Scotland, especially Glasgow, and I've also been to Wales. And so we've just heard about penance, the penance, and Liz, you will hear about the penance in the book. So I do want to come to North Wales. So in a nutshell, Little River, for Liz has a copy there, you will see that I've actually done a family tree at the beginning it tells the story of the Scottish sugar barons or the Scottish plantocracy in Jamaica during the 18th century. Brilliant, Liz. And it's a Scotsman um, loses the family estate, Duncan Hutchison, and goes to Jamaica to make a West India, not West Indian, West India fortune in the 18th century. So. The book spans the highlands of Scotland to Jamaica, West Africa, and that is Nigeria, and then back to Jamaica as such. Now, the themes covered in here, this book is a multiplicity of voices coming through in this book. It really is about the ancestors wanting their story told, but it's a particular story in that I am marrying up fact and fiction to give you a historical novel. 
the novel is over a thousand pages long because obviously 22 years. So this is volume one, um, 17, um, 17, uh, even my brain is, is forgetting it, 1731. Thalma, you've seized up. Yeah. Thalma, you're back again. I'm not again. sure what happened. Was that my... my no, I, no idea. Sorry. Right. So 1731, 1812, volume one. Volume two will be 1800 to 1912. And 1912, we know Titanic went down. And volume three is 1900 to 2014 when you return to Scotland. I take you back to Scotland. So in this particular novel, I'm going to talk a little bit about the making of Little River because I don't want to give away too much information. I want you to go and buy the book and read it. Little bit of a teaser. So <laughs> basically, some of you have heard me say I was in Jamaica in 1999 so I'd been asked to give a lecture. It was an emancipation lecture anyway, about the contribution of the Baptist missionaries. And you heard about Buxton you know, um, earlier on. So I went up to UWE to do some research. And I also went to Clarendon where Claude McKay, my favorite writer, I can't get down his books, um, was born. Whilst in Clarendon, I visited McKay's, um, the church, so that's Zion Hill, I think it's Zion Hill Baptist Church, the house where he grew up. He was not born in that house, and we need to make that clear sometimes when people are talking about McKay. The original house is behind the house at the front. And also I um, visited the high school, Claude McKay High School in Clarendon. I stood on the bridge which is the Suki River Bridge. Hence my, if you see emails from Suki River, it's actually from me. So that's Claude McKay's poem. The following day, I was actually invited to St. Anne's Bay Library. So I've worked at St. Anne's Bay Library, that's the Garvey archives upstairs, because you know Marcus Garvey was born in St. Anne's Bay. And I was supposed to speak on Garvey because it was Garvey's birthday, the 17th of August. However, I woke up out of a dream in which Claude McKay gave me an empty plate with the poinsettia flowers around the rim. So Liz would have heard this before. I thought, what does he want, an empty plate? And by the time I'd got to the library, I said to the librarian, who then, by the way, told me, I can't believe you are Kate Ernest. Your book was book of the year last year. We, we, I came to England, I bought the book, I didn't know you were from St. Anne and it was voted book of the year. So that's how I know. And I said to her, I'm sorry, I can't talk about Garvey today. I've got to talk about Claude McKay. And I promise you the place was packed out with people wanting to hear about Garvey. So when I said, I can't talk about Garvey, I got to talk about McKay that people said, Lord Jesus, but we forget all about Claude McKay. We don't remember him since we're small. You see why McKay wanted his story to be told? So I had my Green Hills of Jamaica bargained with the school or bartered. I gave them a copy of Hope Leaves Jamaica. They gave me a copy of my Green Hills of Jamaica. Did you hear the title? Both Jamaica in both. And so we photocopied some of his poems, poinsettia, you know the one about, I remember, I still remember the poinsettia red, blood red in warm December, the Spanish needle by Claude McKay. And we had an hour of engagement where everybody in that library, you know, cause we just photocopied, got involved and they really enjoyed the session. I came back and I thought, that's the end of Claude McKay anyway. And um, I, it was, you know, 2000, in about September 2000, I had won a scholarship to do my PhD. And Claude McKay came and gave me an empty 
sheet, if you like, A4 paper, lined paper. But before he gave it to me, he folded it down the middle. So, you know, like A5, then it becomes a book size, the paper, if you imagine that, and then you fold it. And I thought, well, what does he want me to do with it? Because I'm so busy. But I realized I had a conversation with an academic who equally was doing a PhD and she was lecturing in maths. And she said, you know, he wants you to write something. And so I started this journey, people, of doing my research and writing things down in between. But in between that, I found myself traveling all over the place and I was writing this book and it was being rejected. So I thought, oh, I've had enough of this book. In 2011, New Year's Eve 2011, Claude McKay appears again. And I'm in a library in New York. He's looking at books, but he won't look at me. And I said to myself, I need his autograph. That's Claude McKay. He, he will not look at me. So I woke up, I said to my husband, I've got to find out what's happening in New York. Claude McKay wants me to go to New York. My husband said, don't be ridiculous. You know, you, it's all in your mind. So I checked out and it was the National, um, National Black Writers Conference at Medgar Evers with College, which is part of the University of New York. Anyway, I literally wrote to them and said, I want to attend. I haven't got my visa. They literally registered me and I paid when I went. I met the curator of the African burial ground near Wall Street. He invited me. I looked around, really almost broke me, weeping the door of no return. Remember I said this, Liz, and the you have to look it up, people. And after that, I simply said to the ancestors, it was a mound of earth where um, the remains had actually been exhumed, but then reinterred, not all of them. I prayed over them and I said, inspire me. I went back to the apartment in Brooklyn and you will see Liz, when you come to chapter two, I was just writing like mad. I returned to London, wrote the novel, sent it off. It was still being rejected. And I thought this is ridiculous. So I'd finished the PhD anyway and couldn't get a lecturing job for various reasons. Um, cut a long story short, started working in local government. So I'm dealing with FGM. Um, it was the Victoria Climbier situation, the torso in the Thames, dealing with all of those issues. And eventually I found myself in 2012 set up, after I came back from New York, I set up my own organization. And next thing you know, it was the Glasgow Olympic Games. Again, I just wrote to the library in Scotland, the women's library. I said, I live in England. I want to be a member of your library. Is it possible? Before I knew it, there was a library ticket on my doorstep. I couldn't believe it. And I thought, that's it. I'm going to Scotland. Off I went to Glasgow, researching up and down Glasgow and met a historian. He's now at Glasgow University working on slavery. He hadn't done his PhD yet. And now he's quite well known, um, but I picked him up quite a lot. And so he's not keen on me. And Professor Sir Tom Devine, uh, who is uh, also at Edinburgh University, not keen on me because I picked them up in public. And so I started going to Scotland and really then got into this writing. And it was only when George Floyd, so Brother Kwaku, apologies, I couldn't come on last night. So much doing and so much organizing, plus my grandson. Anyway, when George Floyd died, I said, we started seeing the amount of black writers um, who had been rejected by mainstream publishers over the years. I suddenly realized I wasn't alone. And I thought, George Floyd's death cannot be in vain. I set up Woman's View less than six weeks after George Floyd was murdered, after I spoke on the Jeremy Vine show and the tears. And so Woman's View started in June, 15th of June, officially launched the 
15th of September, we've not looked back, but Woman's View then enabled me to set up my own publishing house. I didn't tell anybody at the time when it was registered with Companies House. So it was just a platform. It looked like it was a virtual platform for women of African descent. But what was really happening behind the scenes, I suddenly understood that all these black writers were being rejected. And I thought, I am not going to be one of those writers. I'm not going to sit and wait on anybody to validate my work. As long as the ancestors are proud and pleased and I and the fact that McKay gave me this book and all the connections I've just told you, I simply finished the book and then of course it was a job in itself to find the right people to help me to bring it to this stage and i want you to know i'm cutting it short because obviously the time i want you to know that one very important thing happened i couldn't finish the book it was finished but the last sentence on the page was never right i couldn't get it right and the queen dies, you remember, the, the um, when was it? So I finished the, the book and then I realized, I know because the character, so I'm not spoiling it for you, the character needed to go back to Scotland, you see, and that was never going to be the case. I, because I wanted him to be somebody who, he would not go back home, but he would be sending remittances so you can see how Scotland benefit um, or benefited from the trade itself. But something happened and I realized he needed to return to Scotland, you know, the, the body itself. And he needed to go to Edinburgh and he needed to be at the Kirk of St. Giles, which to be to lie in state, if you like, because that's the Church of England and because the Church of England needed to be implicated in this story in terms of slavery. So I thought, OK, then he's going back to Scotland. But by then I was weeping and I thought, this man is ruthless, but he's getting other people to do his work for him, like these, the overseer. So you're going to see all those names. And so I needed Kumasi, because it's my, Kumasi is my favorite, favorite name. And so you will meet an enslaved African. He doesn't play a big part in this, but you will meet at the very end, Kumasi steps in and reminds you. So even though it's like Kumasi saying this that happened to happened to me, it's really Kumasi reminding the readers, this is the man, this is what he was like. And you will see two words at the very end are good, as in serves you right. But those words came to me in a dream only after I had brought Kumasi in and wrote Kumasi into the story. And then I realized the ancestors were saying, grade in the book. And they were giving me an A. And they were also saying the book is good. So I don't need publishers or any academic or anybody to validate this book. It really is about my ancestors, not just McKay, by the way, because this is like the Arabian Nights, a thousand and one stories. This is transculturation. This is cultural retention here. So you will see why those two words are on the page at the very end, but you've got to read the book to find out. But the most important thing happened, the queen died. And to my shock horror, the queen is taken to the Cathedral of St. Giles in Edinburgh. People, do people remember that? The hairs on the back of my neck stood up. That's why the book couldn't finish, because Duncan is taken to the Kirk of St. Giles in Edinburgh. And the Kirk of St. Giles is actually the Cathedral of St. Giles. That's what it's called now. So when you meet Rev. McKay at the beginning, and Duncan, they talk about the Kirk of St. Giles. Remember, 
Duncan went there to lie in state before the queen. And I understood because this book points the finger at the royal family for their role in transatlantic slavery, going back to Elizabeth I. But you will hear about all of um, you know, the, the different themes around slavery. The thing to also remember this Oh, it's happened again. Not sure. I'm not sure why, but we're nearly why the connection. But the book is about cultural retention. So you will meet um, in terms of when we're looking at African retention, Africa in the Caribbean, you will also see it is about resistance resistance to Christianity as well, resistance to that name change that um, in terms of the British planters and on the colonialism, there is a preoccupation with naming. So we heard earlier on about Buxton. So there's Buxton in St. Anne. We heard about Liz, you mentioned um, somewhere a name that has slipped me. Knutsford. Yes, as in Knotsford Boulevard and Jamaica, you heard Rudy talk about the three counties, that's Cornwall, Middlesex and Surrey. And you know about all the parishes in Jamaica, St. Anne, if you think of Queen Anne and all the other places. So this is the story of the Jamaican people, but it is not a story of the Jamaican people alone. So when you read chapter two, you're on a slave ship coming back from Africa. Obviously I was compelled to take you to Africa. I didn't even know I could write a chapter set in Africa, let alone on the slave ship. So you understand why the book was being rejected? It wasn't the quality because because if you saw those rejection letters, you'd be confused why the book was rejected, but it had to be rejected because you needed to go to Africa to return on the ship. You also needed to go to Scotland to see the boy who would then become the slave master. And you need that journey from Scotland on that ship to see the difference in how the British, um, the colonizers, how they traveled to the Caribbean, and then you would see how the enslaved Africans traveled, shackled, etc. But on the ship, what I really want readers to be aware of is um, the merchants. Oh, remember, we had um, the French, the Spanish, the Portuguese, and the British and, and the Dutch. So the merchants on that ship, you have to remember, they represent the different colonizers as such in the different islands. So you'll be thinking of Brazil, Cuba, all of those places are mentioned and that's very important. And again, religion is important. So you're going to meet Reverend McKay and he is Church of Scotland, obviously is Claude McKay's name. You will meet Reverend Ellis later because that's the Church of England. And we know the Church of England was involved as well because the Archbishop of Canterbury, Canterbury recently apologized or something, not enough of course. And so you will see by um, book two, how the Church of England is implicated in this. For instance, the Bishop of Exeter owned enslaved Africans. And also we know that Bank of England. So you will hear about the city of London, that square mile, because I worked at the Bank of England for when I left school, I worked there for 13 years. And the last time I, I spoke there in 2015, so I have my name badge, but did not realize until after George Floyd that 11 governors of the Bank of England owned, as you know, enslaved Africans. So I implicate the city of London. You will hear about the Zong, because remember, and Haiti, 
looms large in this because you have to remember the period in which this is set. So if you imagine um, Haiti, which was then um, Hispaniola, as in part of the Dominican Republic now, and Haiti, Santo Domingo or San Domar, that particular island is only about 100 miles, just over whatever from Jamaica. So you will understand that during the Haitian Revolution, um, warships from Jamaica were sent to Haiti to evacuate some French citizens. So of course you're going to meet a particular French family and they're there for a reason because I am introducing Haiti to you so that you're aware. You're also aware of Grenada. Remember what I said, as much as it's the story of the Jamaican people, you're hearing about the rest of the Caribbean. So if it's the Fed on revolt in 1795 in Grenada, you're hearing about it. If it's the Berbice rebellion of 1763, if it's the Taki revolt, you've just heard uh, mentioned recently in 1760 in St. Mary, then you're going to hear. And the important thing is that my research and PhD and all of that would have very much influenced this book. So Thomas Thistlewood is an Englishman who went to Jamaica, um, probably about, I have the book, but my brain is tired, 17, seven, I think it's about 1753 or whatever, I've forgotten right now. So he wrote a series of journals about his sojourn in Jamaica. Obviously I read them and so I'm influenced by Thistlewood, because he was a dreadful person, but you will also meet Thistlewood in the book because he's invited to dinner, because I want to show you, allow Thistlewood, you know, to, so everything that you read in this book, remember, is actually giving you the history, but many people do not like nonfiction, and a lot of people don't like fiction so I've just married up the two because I enjoy both but I've married up the two you're going to meet Louis Hutchison and he um, is the last white man to be hanged in Jamaica in um, 1773 and he came from Edinburgh he was a doctor and he built a castle castle where I grew up and my family owned 43 acres of that Edinburgh estate because I saw the land papers in 99. So on the front of the book, Liz, if you can look just above the L and the R, you, there's a castle blurred. That's Edinburgh Castle. Yes? Can you see it? A little, it's just, I've blurred it to stop anybody for copyright reasons. That's Edinburgh Castle in the hills of St. Anne people. He actually lived there and it's, he's a real historical figure and he killed many white people, but you will read it in the book. He was apprehended in Kingston Harbor by Admiral Rodney. Now, Admiral Rodney is, also went to, from Jamaica to Haiti to help evacuate the French. And I had the pleasure of going to St. Paul's Cathedral, different story, so I, I won't go into it, while I was writing, but because I'd complained that I wasn't um, Martin Luther King 50th anniversary, they did something at St. Paul's, and I had my hand up to ask a question, and it never came to me, so I wrote and complained, and they gave me complimentary tickets, and one of the managers showed me around. So when I went to the crypt, I couldn't believe it. I was standing in front of Admiral Rodney's, is it called a sarcophagus? You know, the huge thing. And also, I think it was the Duke of Wellington. And of course they're mentioned in the book and the book wasn't published because I was writing. And I thought, oh my God, this is Admiral Rodney. So naturally I put my hand on it and I said, Admiral Rodney, I am writing about you in my book, inspire me now. And I rushed home to to write in a bit about um, Hutchison and also the French, you 
know the bit. So there are all these little coincidences that have happened along the way in order to bring you this book. But for me, most of all, was actually going to America to the African burial ground monument in New York, because when you go there, you are not prepared for how you're going to feel. In the museum, for instance, they reconstructed from the skeletons, not skeleton, the facial, yes, remains, what they thought some of the enslaved Africans from the 17th century looked like. And also it's segregation. It was a black only burial ground. And so when you go outside in the grounds and you see the mound of earth and you know that your ancestors, you know, they actually disturbed them, but then reinterred, you have to pray to uh, tell them to rest in peace. And when you see the door of no return, your heart breaks. And even now you can hear it. You actually can't help crying. And I really wept and then put some coins on the mound and said, right, inspire me to write. And I feel like they've all inspired me to, to write this book. So that's why I've said to you, it is actually a gift from the ancestors, I do not claim to, yes, I did the research and I am a writer, but for instance, the village in Africa, you will come across certain things, you know, um, in the book as such that I spoke to myself writing it. And also even not just, there are different parts in the book that when I look at it, you know, I often say to myself, I can't believe I wrote this. But also remember, this writes back to Jane Eyre as well, because, and especially the other book, because obviously you must understand, I have studied English literature. I also did an MA in post-colonial studies, looking at all these women writers as, and as such. So you're writing back to the 18th century, to all these women, who wrote nonsense about black women, enslaved women. So I literally, and there is also the thing about white women in the book. So I'm also influenced by Professor Hilary Beckles. And by now he should have received a copy of the book um, because he wrote about, he did a lot of research around white women in the Caribbean as such. And sorry, somebody, how, how our ancestors' power and influences. Yes, indeed, the, very much so our ancestors. Yes, I, I was just distracted. So I am, as I've said, Caribbean historians, Brother Cecil Gutsmore, for instance, um, he has done a lot of research around marronage. And over the years, I've had conversations with him. So equally his thoughts, on marinage. Obviously, I've moved on from whatever, you know, we shared in the past in terms of research and discussing the Maroons of Jamaica. So you will meet, because remember, this book is about slavery and slave resistance. It is also about um, the, how can we say, instruments of torture, the oppression, and how enslaved Africans were controlled. So you're going to meet all of that. But the other thing to remember, you see how packed it is from what I'm saying? This book adds to the body of work that has been produced and is being produced on reparations. Because when you read this book and you see not just slave treatment and control, you see the money made from the trade in what I call Black Ivory. That's the title of James Walvin's book. Then you will understand. So in this book, I allow Duncan to write letters home because those letters, excuse me, my husband's been good. I think we've reached half past. Yes, and he's not back. Yes. 
yes, but he's probably thinking I'll give her a bit more time. So what I will say is that the letters home will show you Duncan sends money home on a regular basis. He equally sends money, his collection as a Christian, to the Kirk of St. Giles. But you must understand, Liz, you and I have to discuss this out of this forum. You must understand the remittances are going home to Scotland to the Kirk of St. Giles, that's his collection, because I'm pointing the finger at the Church of Scotland. The remittance... Got another problem again with the connectivity. Whoops. Are you coming back, Vilma? Vilma. This has happened a couple of times as Film has been talking to us. Welcome, Dr. Rashida. Thank um, you. Good to see you. And um, also, Joan Robinson. I don't know if you can hear me, Joan. So I'm waiting to see if Velma's come back. I think Velma's husband's pulled the plug out, actually. She's frozen. <laughs> yes. Oh, dear. Well, what an enthusiastic introduction. If you haven't bought your copy yet, a Velma McClymont's book, Little River, then you'd better get get and look it up and get hold of a copy. Um, I'm not sure where it's available from, usual suspect places, but I think also directly from Woman's View, which is Woman Z V U E. So has ah, you're back again, Vilma. I'm not sure what is going on because we have a new provider and have spent so much money to get the strong signal, and I'm not sure. But we're coming to an end. All all I need really say is that the remittances you will also show how, um, in terms of raw material and resources, you will see that the Caribbean produced nothing at the time time except sugar, rum, the commodities that were sent here. You will see that they have to buy everything. Everything is imported into the island. So in terms of underdevelopment, so that's what you need to look at. And when I mention transculturation, you will see paintings, Liz. So if you see um, Titian's Bacchus and Ariadne or, or David at the gate of somewhere, you know, Daniel in the lion's den. I'm giving you this kind of, if you, um, what I'm giving you is reproduction, how everything is reproduced in the Caribbean, how British culture is reproduced in terms of literature and language. So when you come across storytelling, even if it's just Lucy Lockett lost her pocket, Kitty Fisher found it. Kitty Fisher was a prostitute in the 18th century, but it's also, you know, a nursery rhyme. So I'm showing you um, how a writer like myself, if you were born under colonialism, what a colonial education did to us, our heads are stuffed with facts, British literature, British history. So you heard about Admiral Rodney, you're going to hear about the Duke of Wellington, and you're going to meet the Redcoats. And most of all, you're going to meet the Maroons. And remember what happened to the Maroons, the British soldiers, the Redcoats, how they hunted them down with killer dogs. So you will be meeting the Maroons, and but you will see, and also you will meet African women who fight back. And you, there is a sense that with one particular Seraphima that you might think she's complicit, but this is about survival, what women had to do to survive. And if they um, were born in the plantation house or great house, I don't care what Caribbean academics want to call it when they say it's not great house. I call it what I want because I only have to please my ancestors. As long as I make them proud, I don't care what anybody has to say. And so what you will find is that she is the mistress 
of, um, well, it, it, it really stems from childhood all the way to the end of their lives in the next book, Seraphima. And you will think that maybe there is a bit of complicity sometimes, but it's a need to know and it's survival is the game. And you will meet the other African woman per se, because she's not Creole. She was born in Africa and kidnapped as a child. But I take her to Haiti because I'm then going to show you African cultural retention. So you will be seeing Mayalism and Kumina. And in Jamaica, you talk about Obia, but it's a form of resistance against Christianity. And also the self, the sense of belonging and self and everything is bound up. So what you will find is that you will see what happens when she is a priestess and midwife making herself invaluable and in between that you will hear other stories because this is like the arabian tales so look out in the book that you are dealing with a thousand and one stories maybe rome ancient rome and also in terms of sexuality. So sexuality is very important. So I give you these masculine soldiers, but they, the, the two main ones are gay, right? But you will see because it's very important that we explore sexuality, religion, gender, race. So hybridity, this is a hybrid world. Remember, it's Europe, Africa, in the Caribbean, the landscape. Can you see the image? The landscape is very important people because obviously I was born in rural Jamaica. I think in pictures, everything. So the landscape is always on my mind, but hybridity. And when I say hybridity, I want you to, when you get to read it, Liz, when you see the centaur, you're gonna hear about the centaur right and then you will understand hybridity well is i'm hoping important. lots of other people are going to read it too uh, everybody well i hope everybody on the platform the one, you're going what? to be the one and only speaker that we have and you can take the whole time now velma i'm going to do you a really really big favor at the moment i'm going to say that you need to go and sing happy birthday they're them. not here yet. Oh, my, my husband, God. that's what I'm saying. He's been very clever. He's He said, I'm going to be back for 4.30. And I, when you see me looking sideways, because I'm actually at the front door and they're not here. But anyway, the voice is going to go. And thank you so much for hearing me. You can hear how excited I am. This novel has taken so long to come out of me. And at one point, I dreaded that it would never come out. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now I'm sure that maybe one or two people may want to to speak with Alma, but I just congratulate you. The first mm -hmm. chapter, two chapters I've read now, absolutely fantastic. I can't recommend it enough. It's really, it's uh, it's a history teaching book as well as a as a, a a work of historical fiction. Absolutely brilliant. Okay. Yeah. Um, Rashida, do you want to come in because you've joined us just uh, recently? Just sincere apologies that I was delayed. Um, and I started talking to somebody else and I couldn't get away. So apologies, Velma, and thank you very much. It looks like a very, very interesting book to read. I certainly have made a note of it and uh, hopefully it'll be available um, on Amazon or uh, maybe... No, 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 I'll stop you now. Um, as a business person, yeah. um, one of the things uh, we've got to realize, I keep seeing writers flashing their books. Oh, you can get it on Amazon. Amazon takes nearly 50% of the profits for, for your books, people. Oh, and so right. I thought I am controlling the means of production. So you can get it at my website. It It is available at Waterstones and at oh. Foils. However, people one of the things they equally take the distributors take about 45 percent people of okay. your profits so go to my website and that's why i'm not pushing it from those outlets because it's all right for people to get very excited to say i'm an amazon bestseller 
I normally say how much. Remember, I've been published four times mainstream already. I normally say how much do you actually get after they take their share? Yeah. So website womansview.com. Yeah. And that's spelled W O M E N Z V U E dot com. Yeah. Okay, I've just put that in the chat. Uh, womansview.com. No, woman, woman. Woman. Woman's. Woman's. Right, take, right. take out the E. Right. Where you've got women. Woman view. Yeah, think Caribbean. Think Jamaica. We say <laughs> woman, woman view. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think I was very interested when you started talking about your background in relation to literary background. And from what you've said, you've drawn uh, drawn on other writers and their way of writing, their experiences, particularly about black women or black people in their, their books. And it's lovely to see that happening eventually, that black women or we are able to write literature uh, from our perspective. Mm -hmm. and use maybe uh, people other than black people uh, in similar way to illustrate the points from our point of view as opposed to their points of view. So I'm really looking forward to looking at this new piece. Thank you very much indeed. Brilliant. And the thing to remember, though, I am writing back. So whatever they have written, Yes, I have sir. turned it on its head because it's a matter of resistance. Everything about this book to remember, mm -hmm. all the themes, it is about resistance to the That's dominant why, yeah. narrative. Well, this is why it looks and sounds really very interesting to, to get into. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Oh, thank you. That's been absolutely brilliant. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Velma. And what thank a fascinating you. session it's been. Okay, right. Before I go, anybody else? Vivian? Vivian, any comments from you, Vivian? Yes. I can't wait. Oh, okay. boy. So you need to send me... Um, Liz, could you let Vivian have my email? Liz is so my that... boss. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Liz is not Amazon, she's Liz. <laughs> okay, and we, we will link up. Communicate will... with Liz. <laughs> yes, yes. Liz. June. Liz is well, larger I... than any river. <laughs> June. The Liz June River you... is larger than the Amazon. <laughs> this, uh, this is little river, but it runs deep. Remember, and this this river is actually, by the way, it's a river in the hills of rural Jamaica. The, where I live, the river has dried up. So Liz, you can see a road there with stone walls because these stone walls go back to slavery. Mm -hmm. The British built these, our enslaved Africans built these. To, on either side, Liz, can you see? Yeah. But Which is between, your district? Which was your district? Um, past Claremont, Harmony Vale going up to- I know um, Harmony Vale. No. Yes, and I know. Oh the, my word! Yeah, and I know where the Scottish doctor lived. I passed Edinburgh there. Castle. Edinburgh so Castle. Is, so the road here is before you reach Edinburgh Castle, oh, very... right? And it's called Little River, but it's a dried up riverbed. So any given day, if it rains a lot, a few days later, you can actually see the water oh springing up. But up in the hills. The river is fully up there. It's gone on the ground, but it will meet at Ochi Rios. You know yes. Ochi Rios? Yes. That is where this river goes to people and then to the sea. Yes, so this is Anderson from our quickly, yes. another quickly story. I was um, grappling with the title. It was always going to be Cannon Gate, which is the plantation, Liz, because Cannon Gate re in Scotland rejected the book with a beautiful one full page of, you know, how much they loved it. However, the day my grandmother died, not died, beg your pardon, the day I buried my grandmother, an hour later, so I had two names, Little River, Cannon Gate. An hour later, I'm on the way back to take my sister to the airport. We arrive in Montego Bay, just going towards there is a big sign saying Little River. I said to the taxi driver, oh my God, 
that is the title of my book. And of course, Rose Hall Plantation was nearby. I said to the driver, drop my sister at the airport and we're going straight to Rose Hall. And I walked around Rose Hall Plantation, all the rooms everywhere. So Liz, when you are reading Canongate Great House, know that I've been to Rose Hall and to Heritage Park, you know, Vivian, you know, the other great house down at Heritage Park in St. Anne's Bay. To my horror or surprise, I went to the great house in 2017 in St. Anne's Bay. It slips my mind right now. It remembered that is the settlement area where the Spanish first laid out a town. Civil, when, civil. Civil great house. It's called civil. Well, to my surprise. Oh, there she's gone again. She, she did say it was to her surprise. We need to, we need to go <laughs> then. But I will just tell you, the family who owned the house in the 17th century, I you could have knocked me down with a feather when the day my grandmother is buried, I get the title of my book and I go to um, Seville Great House and see the Hemings family. I thought I was going to faint. That's the title, the, the name the, of the family in this book. The, the soldier, you're going to meet them and they will be very important in the next book and the book after. At the moment you're dealing with Duncan, but you're going to meet Colonel Hemings, Liz, and then his descendants later. I couldn't believe it. I thought this can't be real. So do you understand how my ancestors have actually guided me in the writing of this book, people? The title, the family, the this, the that. Yes, there you are. Uh, uh, Garrick's showing a picture of Rose Hall. Yes. And Garrick's so, continent earlier was how yes. our ancestors power. So there you are. There you are. It's the Jamaican people, those who've gone before, wanted their story told. They wanted it told um, in a correct manner, and they literally also wanted these place names, etc., to be um, remembered. So thank you so much, all Truly of you. Truly amazing. Truly amazing. Cheers. Thank you so much. Much Thank appreciated, Velma. Much appreciated. Your enthusiasm is just bubbling over everywhere. I'm, I'm telling you, I can't. I the can't the help river, it. The river is just flowing. Burst it, bunk. <laughs> well, trust me, trust me. This story has been inside me for 22 years. Hey. So, you know, to, to get it out. But remember, it's not even out yet. The other two are bubbling away inside me and mm -hmm. desperate to to get out mm -hmm. but you know all rivers eventually flow to the sea yes. so yes. we will get there but vivian liz we need to spread the word because this book has to get this book is not so much by the way for here you heard what rudy was saying about the various villages and windbrush what is really really important right now is the referendum that is coming in Jamaica. And this is far more important. Windrush is important, but this is the book that is going to help the Jamaican people to make the decision to realize that they have to cut ties with the royal family. You cannot have a king, of an absentee landlord as head of state, because if you know Jamaica, not Kingston, you will see the poverty in Jamaica elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's very romantic to talk about Jamaica and what we can and can't do. But the average person in rural Jamaica is only interested in when is my, where, you know, where, what's the word? When am I going to receive my remittances? Because we yeah. are still sending remittances. Can I afford to eat? Can I afford to pay for my children, you know, to go to school? Because, you know, you have to pay a certain amount. There's basic school and from basic school is secondary school. You have to pay for transport because the schools have been closed. Children are being bused to school. Those are the issues people are concerned with. There's no running water up in the hills. So sometimes, you know, water truck has to go up. And people are, you know, the tanks, the public tanks, 
do people know what i mean you know that where you like reservoirs the public yeah. tanks and the water yeah. those are still being used so if you say to somebody in rural jamaica windrush they say oh no them people who i did gone away that my right because them them make the grade we still left behind and they are so they are more interested in day-to-day -day life how can i survive because remember there's no recourse to public funds like we have here and people rely on remittances from abroad i've been sending remittances since i was 17 years old and so this is why please people you um it's been done already it as i've said vivian it's uh, it has actually reached quite a few places in jamaica but there will be a copy for every library in jamaica a copy for every college and every high school school in Jamaica because they have to be prepared in time before a referendum to know the history of Jamaica and why it is they are voting for a new beginning. So this is the purpose. This is why my ancestors want this book out. It is the urgency of getting it into the public. So we're not talking about a book that needs to be sold to make money for me or anything, 210 copies, free copies will be going to Jamaica. Yeah, so these these are not books they, for people to buy. There will, there will be a free copy for every high school, every library and every college in Jamaica. Yeah. Excellent, excellent, excellent. That's it. Yeah. Mm. And maybe, Selma, yep. the next time you come and join us, when you'll be the only speaker and we'll just concentrate on your book and some more of us will have read it as well, mm. so we'll be ask questions and make points, then maybe we can record that and then the schools would be able to see you being interviewed. That is what we're going to yeah. do. I, ca I can see they're coming now at the window, people. Well, okay. Thank you so much, Pelman. Enjoy, enjoy your again. evening, yes. All right, then. Take Thank care. you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Lisa, I'm sorry I have to go. I have yes. other matters of state. Other okay. matters of state. Okay, Vivian, take care. Yeah. Okay, Vivian, take care. Go and eat your mango. Please. <laughs> 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 see you. Yes, I'm not going anywhere. Well, cool. <laughs> okay. What good? Yeah, yes, I was just yes. I was just speaking to Sir Cliff and we're a bit disappointed because the list of instruments that we gave for um yes. Ivor. Okay. Right. Ivor we, for Ivor. we had a meeting yesterday. Oh, did you? About our penance project. This is and the a list of instruments, were, uh, a, a set of instruments were sent to Jamaica and um, a very clear list was made of which instruments were to go to penance and which instruments to go to the Alpha Boys School, I think it was. Unfortunately, things have been a mix up when the instruments were shared around. And no, I don't see how that can happen. How can it be mixed up when it's been itemised? It's well, intelligent people we're dealing with. You yeah, with me? Yeah. yeah, I can't really discuss it now. No, I know, but I'm just letting you know, me and Sir Cliff were a bit disappointed. Well, I'm sure yeah. you are. So, yeah, because well, we really wanted the penance to have that, those instruments, it was like a band, mm. you know? Well, it's clearly been a misunderstanding because the big black drum, for example, which shouldn't have gone to penance, has is now Coy's got. Coy is the chairman of the Jamaica Wales um, Alliance group that dealing with this so he's going to speak to um lola and sort it out okay and we'll let you know but please thank you very much yes because that shouldn't have happened okay and so back to the plot then joan i don't know if you're still listening in if you are do you want to say anything because you're saintly like been there for ages uh -huh. Hi. Yes, oh. I, I've been sitting here listening. Very interesting. Um, yes, I, I'm Joan and I, I'm a secretary at the Jamaica Society in Reading. Wonderful. And yes, um, very interesting. 
all about the, the Windrush um, events that are going on, because we are having Windrush events in Reading this year as well. And a matter of fact, there is a museum, they're putting together things, the museum from the Windrush generation. And I know the lady who runs the Jamaica Society in Basingstoke, they've got their, that was on the news. I don't know if you saw that, that was on the news and they, they have a, a, an exhibition at the Basingstoke Museum as well. So yes, um, we're putting on a Thanksgiving service. There's going to be um, um, interviews with the elderly Windrush generation and all of that. Yes, so we have quite a quite a big program for okay. the well, what I've put on the screen, I don't know if you can see it. I can. This is the draft programme of the next few weeks. And so I'm going to skip down to Friday the 16th of June um, when Brendan Carr, the community engagement yeah. coordinator from Red Museum, yeah. is going to join us. So I do hope that, Joan, you'll be able to join Yes, us. yes, I, I've been meeting with Brendan because I've given him a couple of items for the museum exhibition right. well so. i especially wanted you to know that you know because of what you've said I've, mm. I've made that arrangement in that same session which garrick's going to be recognizing what's going on in the uk for windows 75 uh -huh. um, uh, we've also got um rosalind crocker ahmed the senior manager of partnerships and public engagement at the national maritime museum she's the windrush programming list so that session is going to be as well about what museums are doing mm, mm, and the, um, the following week we'd hope to get through simpson to come but that doesn't work out because she isn't actually doing windrush things this year but just to go back to the top of the list today's session was 2 30 till 8 30 Two thirty, sorry, in the UK, eight thirty in Jamaica. And yes, I know. The... I do get, I do get your um, email. I do oh, get the email. That one. I get two from two different people. I think I get one from you and from from somebody else as well. The Jamaica Society gets. Oh right, yes. right. Okay, so oh. well, I hope you don't mind that. But next one, this is a bit exceptional. So mm. Victor Richards is going to talk on his film Streets Paved with Gold, and then. Dr. Marcella Day is going to be interviewed by June Elizabeth. Hmm. Now that's at 12.30, 12.30, and that's the Friday of um, Spring Bank Holiday in the UK. So that's 12.30. Uh, I've and got hmm, 12.30, I, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to a, a Windrush classical concert in London on that day. Also, 6.30 a.m., we know it's really too early for you in Jamaica. We're sorry, but we'll record it. It's the only time that Victor Richards could mm. do it. And then on Friday the 9th of June, um, and that's back to the usual time of 2.30 in the UK, what we try to do is have a conversation first with the people who hook up so we know what's going on, and then start recording at 3 o'clock or 9 o'clock in Jamaica. But it has meant for example, today, that the sessions really run on a lot. Mm -hmm. Now, June Elizabeth is going to present Black History. She's got a PowerPoint presentation. We're looking forward to hearing your story, June Elizabeth. And then Bill Hearn, who has, uh, have, he recognises um, the individuals who are actually on the Windrush. It's his little project, is to find out about the, the passengers who are actually on the Windrush. So he's mm -hmm. going to talk about myths, music and murder, many of the myths and understandings about who was on board and why. So that should be interesting with the focus on musicians as well. So then we're also looking at what else we can do. It'll be a catch up session on what's happening in the UK by the time we get to Friday the 23rd of June. So we're just working our way through it at the moment. So that's, uh, that's mm -hmm. what we're up to and we'll let everybody know. And I'm is, happy. It, is it possible to have a copy of that um, itinerary that you just yes, it would be a good idea. I'll send it out with the next general email, but I'll send it out um, probably later today. Okay. Thank you. Uh, itinerary. Okay, yeah, I'll do that. Thank you. Okay, so anybody else for anything else? Yeah, when did you say Bill was coming on? Which date? 
Quacko, that's wonderful. Thank you for sticking in with us. Yeah. Yes, what did you say? Yeah, I was asking when on your itinerary, when did you say Bill Hen was coming on? What day? Oh, sorry, let me put it back on again. Um, right, just a minute. Let me just uh, find where it's gone again. Sometimes I lose, lose the plot here. <laughs> Right, okay, this is the itinerary, okay, and the Bill Hearn date is here, the 9th of June. He's okay. done some yeah, really, thanks a lot. really interesting work about um, about who was actually on the Windrush, because they've, they've actually got the, um, actually got the documentation, haven't they, the list of the passengers. You can find that online, so it's just fascinating. We haven't included a very interesting character who was on the Windrush, um, who um, was called Mr. Lawrence, I can't remember his first name, but his son, um, I've met in Australia, Levi Lawrence, and when we did a Windrush conference last year, his son in the UK spoke about his story, and it's not a very well-known story, and he actually recorded... Um, for the BBC, his story. So I think I might put that in as the last, the last one on that last session, because to listen to him telling his story, relating back to Windrush and his expectations. He was a very capable, able, um, educated man, and he, you know, his experience of life in the UK was was quite challenging. But very interesting. His wife's also still alive, and um, in in Birmingham, and so we might manage to not get her on the Zoom, but we might manage to get Levi or one of his colleagues to have a chat with her, and you know, tell us a few little stories or something just to bring it to life again. Okay, um, Rashida, you have to unmute yourself, Rashida. <clears throat> I was coughing away, that's why I'm muted. Uh, Liz, um, in Bir I live in Birmingham, oh, yeah. um, and uh, uh, last year I went to the uh, Windrush uh, Ball, I think it was called. Oh, yes. Uh, and there is another one this year, and I can't seem to find details from anywhere. I can send it to Liz, and she can send it to you. It's on June the 10th at Edgebaston Stadium. Oh, that, and oh that's where it was last year. two tickets to go. Um, so, on June the 10th, and that's my birthday. I'll be officially getting a pension. <laughs> oh, congratulations, June. And so 10th of June at Edgebast, and that's where it was last year, because I went to the last year one. That was fantastic. It was really absolutely, the way it was put together was absolutely wonderful. Yeah, I think Liz is going, because I'm... I met her with um, Marcia Dunkley. She told oh, I said, I wanted Marcia. to go, and I didn't have anybody to go with. So she said, well, me and Liz are going. So I said to the man, I'll have I'll have a ticket, and I bought a ticket for somebody else. So I no, thought, at I least I'll Marcia get to well. No, I know, <laughs> I know Marcia well. I did email her, but she's very busy in Wales at the moment. Yeah. And she was at one of my meeting, one of, one of our meetings in Birmingham. So yeah. Liz, if you could send me some details of where I can get those tickets from, I'll be yeah. eternally grateful. And it's a fantastic event. I've been going, you know, before I used to live in, I've lived in Australia for four years, the past four mm. years. Mm. But normally I'd be in the UK for half of the year and mm. May and uh, October through till, till it started getting warm again. <laughs> So um, I used to go along and I've got an award that I was given by the um, Association of Jamaicans in Birmingham oh, and yeah. I'm so proud of it. And I once, heard, a very long time ago, I heard um, uh, Professor Sir Geoffrey Palmer speak. Oh, yes, yes. And it's the first time I'd ever heard him speak. And I honestly thought I could have listened to him for the rest of my life. It was so <laughs> interesting. And suddenly, through that conversation, through that presentation, I thought, you can understand it. It's possible to understand black history. And mm. prior to that, black history was always something to me, which I knew, knew some vague stories, but didn't really realize that you could really understand it and that all the information was there. And I suppose, in a way, it's a catalyst to what I've done ever since. 
is to you know really find out on the basis that if I can find out, then other white people can find out too. Absolutely, yeah. So um, it is so such an excellent and brilliant event, and you have to wear your posh frock. <laughs> yes, yes, I did, I did. <laughs> I've got some lovely photographs with the ladies from the uh, from the army. Uh, oh, and, um, yeah. and also with, of course, Marcia. Marcia and I had a photograph taken together. I've oh. got a very good uh, photograph, uh, taking photographs. But nevertheless, Marcia pulled my arm and said, come on, let's get one done. <laughs> Marcia is a, um, a very good colleague of ours on these um, shows, um, shows, posh word for chat. Um, and um, she met me when I was first there after I came, flew in. She came over to Birmingham and met with me and uh, Natalie Fagan Brown, who's the uh, chair of the North Wales Jamaica Society, but she lives in uh, um, Wensbury. So that's, that's right. To stay first, mm -hmm. and then um, the last few days I've been up in North Wales, um, and I'm now back in England because, as I say, Caroline's getting married tomorrow. It's very exciting. So congratulations. Recorded here on the Black History Conversations to Caroline Sansom, who is going to become Caroline Evans. So that's exciting tomorrow. Anyway, back to the back to the Black History plot. So in North Wales, I have booked Penryn Hall. Um, I'm secretary of the North Wales Jamaica Society. I've booked Penryn Hall for the um, 22nd of June. And Garrick Prayog has very kindly agreed to be the lead presenter from Justice for Windrush Generations. Mm -hmm. Now, it's a bit exceptional because the idea of getting anybody to come to Wales um, on the 22nd when you're all so busy in your own communities is pretty remote. But Garrick's been able to alter around another arrangement. So in the morning, we're going to do um, presentations about Justice for Windrush Generations because the Welsh Government, and I'm just going to share the um, PowerPoint a minute because something very, very interesting appeared. Uh, just just take me a moment. I'm sorry, let me just find the right page on it. Last week, last week, I'd just like to hear this again. Last week, the um, Welsh Government... Um, put out the call for application for funding and it's got to be in by um, um, Monday. So there's a week to put in application for funding at this late date. Anyway, this is the bit in Welsh. So, um, a very good bit of information there, but this is the caravan information from the advert. So this is the Welsh bit, this is the English bit. We also, this is the Welsh government saying in the information that they're sending out um, to people to recognise Windrush Day. We also remain committed to seeking justice for the Windrush elders in line with the Wendy Williams report published in on the 19th of June, 2018. Now I'd just like to say that the only reason that the Welsh government probably realised this is because Garrick Pragog and colleagues, I think um, June Elizabeth, were you there as well when we spoke to the Welsh government on Zoom and told them about the Wendy Williams report and how the government were trying to step back on some of the proposals. So I'm hoping that Garrick is actually going to present the 14 recommendations of the Wendy Williams report, because nobody in Wales will understand what's going on with the well, Wendy Williams. 13 recommendations. 13, sorry. Yeah. So why does it say, let me go back onto this again, share the screen again. Do, do, do. Well, she came back to, to check on what they'd done, and they'd only done eight. <laughs> So I think that this is, is seriously important because the Welsh Government doesn't follow the English Government mm -hmm. and it's difficult to talk about this because the way the English Government operates in the House of Commons sounds as if they're the British Government 
but there are times when they actually act as the English government. And, for example, the English government have stopped the funding for Windrush Day this year, I understand. But the Welsh government, maybe at the last minute, they're actually putting on something. So, so that's good to know. And also that... Um, that the recommendation contribution from men and women across the Commonwealth who helped to build modern Wales and make this country their home. This is another one of Garrick's points um, because it's right across the Commonwealth. It's not just Windrush generation, people who sailed on the Windrush or who came from Jamaica or even just came from the Caribbean as well. Yeah. And also yeah. the Grand Aims to help support events that will celebrate our Windrush generation yes, and contribute to the Welsh Government's commitment to deliver an anti-racist Wales by 2030. Right, so that's really interesting for me. Rashida? You have to unmute yourself. I think uh, Wales, in terms of education, is doing s some really good work. Really uh, good. And I think yeah. we need to keep our eye on it because... Uh, uh, because they have um, got a number of recommendations. Charlotte Williams is leading on that one with the government. And I think that's far, far ahead of what uh, English government is doing in terms of education. I'm far, far ahead of it. And I had the pleasure of meeting Charlotte some months ago. And I have also worked in Wales, uh, in Paris for over a year and would support, um, I worked in, in local authority in Mid Wales, Paris, as, you, as we know it, uh, and uh, thoroughly enjoyed that time. But it shows how much work is needed, that the work that Charlotte is doing uh, in education, in terms of curriculum, and also in terms of, um, education widely, more widely, uh, and in particular, um, uh, the inspection service. Yes, I think that's really important, Rashida. I'm interested to hear that um, what you said. Charlotte Williams is somebody that I know, and she came on the Black History Conversations and introduced the work that they were doing in schools in Wales. Charlotte was in Australia when I used to go there a few years back, and we managed to meet just before she managed to get back to the UK after some time during COVID, but mm. whereas I didn't. So, <laughs> yeah, so it's a while since I've actually met her, but mm -hmm. uh, she joined us and she's she's very supportive. And, and the work that's being done is amazing, but the challenges in Wales yes. are very significant. Mm -hmm. um, there are um, a number of people from the Caribbean communities, the Windrush Generation communities in South Wales, but very few in North Wales. So we actually have a North Wales Jamaica Society and a South Wales Jamaica Society. And the South Wales Jamaica Society mainly under the chairmanship of um, Hilary Brown, uh, they mainly look at looking after the needs of the community in South Wales. Mm. Whereas in North Wales, the North Wales Jamaica Society has a different focus. Yes, we recognise those of the Windrush generation who have lived in North Wales, recognise their successes. And this year we're going to be celebrating the success of, um, um, uh, of the achievements, lifetime achievements of Enrico Stennett, and also the lifetime achievements of um, Karen Cross's dad, Gilbert Mullings. And they're both in the Jamaicans uh, in leadership publication by the Jamaican High Commission. So that's going to be a bit special. Mm -hmm. um, so we concentrate on looking at the links between North Wales and Jamaica because the Pennant family in North Wales had um, six plantations in Jamaica, five in Clarendon, and Ivor's on the line now, and um, he's in the village of Pennants, and so we have a Pennants project, and I could just show you a few photographs if you like. I think I might be able to find a photograph of what happened in Pennants on, um, on Tuesday, but while I'm looking for that, Garrick, do you want to have your turn?
just to say, Liz, um, Wales is a big country. And I know there's some politics between <clears throat> North Wales and the rest of Wales, but I'm hoping that through the conference, we might find some ways of building relationship, um, you know, uh, outside North Wales and connecting with the rest of Wales, because I think that is so important that the the history and the messages that we're trying to to get across, um, politics should not be, you know, uh, a barrier. Um, so we're encouraging people to work together, um, uh, to cross boundaries. And if there is work being done in other places, then we need to be shouting about it. We need to, to get it out. But we don't know what's being done in other places. Um, and we know that historically, um, the whole of Wales have got connection with the Caribbean and with Jamaica. So, you know, we need to, to, to sort of, you know, focus on the whole country of Wales rather than bits of it. See? So I'm hoping that we can kickstart some conversation uh, across Wales um, that we can, after the conference, we can continue to, uh, you know, to work and, and build some relationships. I think that's excellent, Garrick. It's much needed. Yeah. You Maybe you could have a North yeah. Wales and South Wales um, platform for them on on this platform. After the Windrush, you could, you know, do something and have them on to meet all of us as well. That would be very and, nice. And you yes, remember please. to let Gilbert know, Gilbert Watkins yeah. in North Wales. He would love to know in time. So in case he's going to Bristol, he can change his itinerary. Yeah. We'll see what we can do with that story. So let me just show you um, a, a few a few photographs here. Right. The first photograph is of the North Wales Society Library, which is now, um, looks a bit scruffy, doesn't it? But I believe it was such hard work getting these. And I have to thank Garrick Prayog, for getting these out of the storage where they've been for four years and helping me get them into a new home at the um, Equality House, which is in Penmine Mower, North Wales, and it's uh, where Neuren are based. That's the North Wales Regional Equality Network. So really pleased about that. Pence, Jamaica. This was the Penance Labor Day activity. Now, the North Wales Jamaica Society has managed to pull together some funds from other organisations that support us, and we sent over £850 to pay for the cost of all the activities that were to go on during, uh, on Labor Day. So here the ladies are clearing out so that they can get on with the painting. All this beautiful, bright paint is bought. Doesn't the outside look gorgeous now? <coughs> Here we are with parents busy there cleaning up again. Yes, got the mops and buckets out, the floor cleaned. This is Toth Nelia Ellis. I can recognise her from behind. She's the um, chair of the Penance Rotary Community Corps, and it was the Rotary Community Corps that organised this in partnership with the North Wales Jamaica Society. Next week, I'll be able to show you some pictures of it all finished this is very much work in progress and the fact that it took from monday uh, in bangor north wales to send the money western union to be picked up in jamaica the paint was then that's that's good news oops they've painted the um play equipment and they're refurbishing inside, isn't it good? And and this uh, this wire here that keeps it all safe and wire across the gates, this was paid for by the North Wales Jamaica Society. A few years ago, we haven't actually sent the basic school. We even got the children involved. Isn't that so beautiful? Look at him. 
There we are. Everybody's involved, isn't it? The young and the old. <laughs> yeah, they're going to have to repaint the uh, national heroes again. But look mm. how look how tired and worn it was looking. And yeah. yet when I went yeah. last time, it was looking lovely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so. Well, it's Here weather, we isn't it? The weather. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And also, during COVID, the termites did dreadful damage to the yeah. Uh, yeah. the books and to the records in the primary school office. And I have got some pictures, but I don't think they're on here, of what the primary school did. So uh, definitely an improvement. Now, we're just trying to get some monies to go over from the Douglas Pennant Family Foundation, this is the Pennant family, Pennant Castle, um, and those funds are to um, uh, provide new toilet facilities at the basic school, and also to build an infant department at the um, at the main school. Didn't realise how many pictures there were. Just keep going to the end, get to the end. Yeah, so evidence of great works. You can see how excellent, how excellent, shabby it looked. But um, yeah, they've really, uh, really done a good job. So that's nice. That was lovely, Tothnelia sent. I like the colours, the, the choice of colours. Yeah, yeah. Very, Iva, very nice. Mm. Iva? Yes, Liz. Yeah, Iva, um, June Elizabeth raised the point a little bit earlier about the about the instruments and said how upset Clifford was. And I explained that we discussed it yesterday and we're going to get it sorted out with the with uh, Koi and, and hopefully we'll... I don't know if I'm quiet this morning. Up north, I'm quiet about, about um, Mrs. Um, Gamma Khan. She could be in but she could be um, checking out to see what happened. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure it'll get sorted out. That's really yeah. good. Okay, right. Anything else from anyone else? Can't remember if I got anything else on well, the phone. Well, well, I just want to say I can't wait to give you a big cuddle and a <laughs> kiss. <laughs> you know, on Monday and Tuesday, the Birmingham Black Heritage Walk Trail came to Northampton University and they um they gave us a two day kind of bespoke training so that we can do our Windrush walk on Windrush Day before we start the Windrush event at five o'clock. So just now, last week we've got a new mayor and yesterday they rang me up and said, the mayor wants to know, can he come on the Windrush walk train? <laughs> but it was, I um, mostly came from behind me and she was just hugging me up and hugging me up. But it's like we'd met before, but we'd only met on this platform. But it's like I yeah. knew her, you know. Yeah. That, was, that was the same, June Elizabeth. That was the same um, the other week when Marcia and Liz um, arrived in in uh, in Parliament. In Parliament. Yes. Yeah, it was just yeah. brilliant, you know. Yeah. Well, I'm waiting all this for that time experience. we were just having meeting on Zoom, yeah. you know, um, and then the real person, it, you know. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, because Liz. Did text me and say she's going to meet you in Parliament. I mm -hmm. said, Well, I'm hosting it. I was the Zoom host. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I can't wait to be the, the real host. <laughs> Elizabeth, one of the problems since I've been over here, Quacka will just come to you in a moment. One of the problems since I've been over here is that the car that I got set up to have to use um, yes. has a problem with the registration document and they're changing the number plate over. So right. I haven't been able to have my own car. Otherwise, I'd have bombed around and seen people. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm now um, I'm going from here. I'm going to be in Birmingham. And then I'm coming over your way because I need to see my cousin in Leicester. Um, right. so not too far from you. So I'll be on the What phone. date is that? Um, I don't know yet. I've got well, to... let me know. As soon as yeah. I've got the car, I'll let you know. Yes, I'll... yes, let me know. And it'd be so nice if you, you're here for the 30th of June. Because remember I told you Juanita's coming up from London to do a presentation and Lorna from Luton. Glenda Caesar says she might come and surprise me. So on Windrush Day, Gary, mm -hmm. you're going to be, you're doing a conference, is it a one-day conference? Yes, I'm going to be in North Wales all day. Right. Um, yes. To support Gary. Liz for that one. Gary, just then... before, Gary, can I interrupt? I'm very rude. Go on. Um, just 
just just to say, Quacko has his hand up for ages, and he may need to go. Quacko, have you got something to? Come yeah, in no, I'm I just going to really mention what I've already put in the chats. I um, I've written a few thoughtful, provoking articles on Windrush. I'll be doing a fiscal event at Lambeth Town Hall on June sixteenth. Call another Lambeth Windrush history. 23rd June 1948. And then uh, a few days ago, we launched something called Disrupting British Afghan History Sessions. So these are going to be Zoom, monthly Zoom meetings in which we look at particular specific British Afghan or British Afghan topics. So Windrush uh, is the current one. So we've got out of the five, three of the programs, June, July, and October will we'll be on Windrush. For people that are doing rush programs, that want to, it's about fact checking, fact checking. So you've been to an event, you've heard something, uh, was it quiet or whatever? So that's what the purpose. And then we did one on our uh, Claude Jones, I think in September, no August. We've got Carnival and all that connection to Claude Jones and stuff. And then I think the last one we'll be looking at how Black History Month uh, came to be. So yeah, I thought I'd just put that in. That's about it. Quacko, right. um, is those events being listed in the calendar? I don't know. Windrush 75 what, uh, Network. Yeah, in the Windrush 75. Are yeah. they being listed? Uh, the, the first one is the one on Lam Lambert Town Hall on June 16th is yeah. the uh, Disrupting. This was just announced two or three two days ago. So I yeah, don't we can still add. Yeah, yeah, you can still add stuff to the yeah, calendar. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just make sure the information gets to... um. Um, I think it's Cameron. 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 Don't, don't worry, I'm I'm on, I'm, I'm on the network, so we'll good, do it. Good, good, good. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Is it going to be hybrid, um, Quacky? No, the 16th of June is the fiscal thing at Lambeth Town Hall, and the rest are on Zoom. Right. right. Okay. So it's Mondays. We can't see what time it is on event. Right, let's look. Oh, okay. It's 6.30 6 to 8.30. Yeah, 6th oh, of right, yeah. Monday the 19th of June, July yeah. the 10th, October yeah. the 2nd, Disrupting African History Sessions, mm. Fact Finding Windrush. Yeah. Oh, it's really interesting. Okay, so um, that's really, really good, Kwaku. Shall I send this round to the whole of our mailing as well? Yes, I think that's a good idea, yeah. Mm. Yeah, that sounds, mm. sounds brilliant. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you've got different ideas for the themes in the. Um, right, good, excellent. It's going to be overwhelming. There's going to be so many things. Mm, going on. Yeah, yeah. The, the plan, of June Elizabeth, uh, for the twenty second of July of uh, June in uh, Bangor, North Wales, um, is that um, this is going to be the first. North Wales Jamaica Society public meeting for a very long time. I've been away all this time and it's just not been possible to arrange anything. So um, it's very special. So we've asked the um, town clerk. He's absolutely fascinated. He's a new guy and he's really, really interested. So we booked the town hall from nine o'clock through to about five. Now we have previously used Henry Hall. We previously used it um, when the Jamaican High Commissioner came to um, uh, Wales and he came and I met him in, in um, South Wales and we went to an event at the College of Music with Race Council Cymru and we did, a, did things in South Wales with him and then travelled on the train to North Wales and um, in North Wales he did a reception at the um, this town hall, and we had about two hundred and fifty people came that time. So we're going the same sort of model as that. We're going out to all, all and sundry. We when we did North Wales Jamaica side things before, we didn't really do that until the Jamaican High Commissioner came. So we're going to invite the Lord Lieutenant of Gwynedd. We're going to invite the mayor. Well, that's going to be hosted by the mayor of Bangor, the new lady mayor of Bangor. We're going to uh, invite all the councillors, all the local MPs from the Parliament in London, but also we have um, 
they're called MSs, they're from the Senate, the Parliament in Cardiff. So I'll invite all of those people and we invite everybody else that we can think of. So I'm just Lovely. writing at the moment. So in the morning, Garrick is going to speak about um, justice for Windrush wow. Generations and is going to explain. And Garrick, I hope you'll do something about the Wendy Williams thing as well. So we'll be focusing on, on, on Windrush in the morning. Well, these two histories, Mr. Mullings and uh, Enrico Stennett, Gilbert Mullings and Enrico Stennett. And also, um, if Gilbert is happy to um, be a part of that, that, then we'll include Gilbert. And we might include... Um, we might include Mr. Lawrence because his son now lives in Wales, but it's a very tenuous mm. link. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so we'll, we'll cover that in the morning. And then nine o'clock, we're going to have Jamaican breakfast, peanut porridge and fresh fruit. Um, lunchtime, 12 mm. till 2, we're going to have a Jamaican lunch. I've booked it already with Maggie, who's a very good good chef she's nigerian but she does cook good jamaican food and um then in the afternoon we're going to do a two-hour session on the penance project specifically um mm. and we'll be inviting iva and the others because if iva doesn't mind getting up early then it's oh, lovely it'd be, it'd be hybrid hybrid um, yes, I think. That <laughs> you can that. invite Iva. <laughs> yes, yes. So Iva's coming as well. I'm yeah. coming to this conference on the 22nd of June because apparently oh. Penryn Hall has now got, for this conference, Iva, we're inviting you in the afternoon. But you'll have the to be there at 8 o'clock. What right. afternoon? What afternoon are you afternoon? This is the 22nd of June. Oh, I would love to come, but I will have pass in the morning. Morning to you, eight o'clock in the morning. Oh, wow. Uh... I'll put it in his book, so we'll remind him again. So we're, we're collecting up um, photographs and all sorts of things that we've been doing with the project, and it's possible that we may be able to get um, Professor Anthony Bogues to come and speak about okay. the Robert Rumble story. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Well, lovely. I, I, I will... I'll, I'll, I'll leave my Caribbean um, buffet to make sure I come on that Zoom. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> and then, because we, after we raise the flags, we've got um, a steel band to march us down into the museum. Remember, I said they had 150,000 and they've got an exhibition. Then we've got, a, uh, after we do our ceremony and launch of the museum, we've got a Caribbean lunch. So I'll forfeit that to come and on that Zoom. And then I'm going to go down to London to support Glenda Caesar in the evening. <laughs> You're a busy Just lady. Do what you can. We'll record everything, June Elizabeth. Lovely, lovely. Yeah. Okay. So that's the, that's the plan. Does that sound all right, Garrick? Sounds incredible. <laughs> Sounds very yeah. wonderful. Yeah. I'm happy with that. There's a lot of work going on behind the scene. I know you're... You're busy coordinating and pulling people together. Um, and um, just before the event, I will do a radio piece on uh, BBC Radio Merseyside to promote the event. Mm. Well, we we can probably do, you could probably do something on BBC North Wales as well, because they've yeah. contacted us because yeah. they really need more diversity presentations mm. and things. So I think... Uh, uh, Without saying too much, things have been very difficult for the North Wales Jamaica Society in the last four years since I've not been there. Um, oh dear. Um, thing, we now have a new chair and a new committee, and we're really, we're really on the road again. So Good. it's our first Good. opportunity to really uh, yeah. um, move forward. And having a base now at the Equality Centre in Penmama. We'll yeah. make it makes all the difference yeah mm. and so gary i wonder if you you want to consider i'm going to a meeting with them on tuesday mm. um so at Penman now the um neuron people i wonder if you want to have um a base there for justice for windrus generation in wales yeah i'm gonna have a conversation about that i'll come back to you with that yeah mm. 
Mm. Okay, so I think that could be really very interesting. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so anything else then from uh, Rashida? Anything else you want to? I think it sounds incredibly busy. It's, uh, I mean, the pro, the whole program. I don't know how you're doing it. Absolutely amazing. So, yeah. well done to everybody. Mm. Um, I'm just totally a, a speechless, to be quite honest, from what I'm uh, hearing and what I'm seeing already happening. But please, June or Liz, do let me know where I can get the ticket for Thursday, uh, the 10th of June in Birmingham. I don't want to miss it because I did go last year and mm. thoroughly enjoyed it. And I haven't been able to get tickets because I think the people I had tickets on from before uh, are not available. Um, right. I'll get that sorted out next when mm. we finish this program. Yeah. And thank you very much. Mm. Really appreciate it. And thank Lovely. you so much for allowing me to come and join you. I've really thoroughly enjoyed All it. Right. Excellent. Anyway, Excellent. Yeah. It's really interesting who manages to join and who doesn't in each mm. Always yeah. fascinating. Oh. And also, it's fascinating to to see that in many ways people are connected from different angles. Yes, I know Marcy. I know Charlotte. I know people in Jamaica like Carlton Duncan. Yeah. I know Cecil from another group mm. I belong to. Yeah, and I know Rosemary Campbell, who's also you know quite oh, yes. active in Jamaica in terms Did of education. In Jamaica, Rosemary Campbell. Is Rosemary Campbell in Jamaica? She was for her book launch. I think she went there for one of her book launch. I understand. I may be wrong, but I think she went because, you know, she's written this fantastic book. No. Tell us about it. No, she wrote a book uh, last year and she's doing uh, quite a lot of presentations. She's been to Britain a couple of times or when I say Britain, she, I think she, I don't know if she did one presentation well. So certainly she did one in Birmingham with the education, Birmingham Education Partnership. And she was in London. I had the privilege of, uh, because I worked with Rosemary many years ago, we taught together uh, when we were first teachers. Uh, so we go back a long way. Um, oh but so she has uh, written this book on education uh, in terms of race and equality and inclusion and leadership and so on. And there was lots of people in Birmingham who are doing lots of things like Gus John, who we know uh, has written for many years. He's involved in it. Uh, and uh, the group that I'm involved with is Carlton Duncan and Cecil and a few other people, Gilroy Brown, who is also in Birmingham. So there's a lot of groups that I'm involved with on the, you know, sort of in it or on the, uh, on the from the periphery. That's really interesting. I and mean, to me, it's fascinating because I'm getting to know people mm. across the UK in places that I would never have known mm. before Zoom. Mm. Um, so it's just just incredible. June Elizabeth has just sent me on my phone um, Gary's phone number for you to get in touch with. Um, I'm just putting it in the the chat now, so you have to just be patient. Oh seven five nine four three two five five seven nine. I don't know if you've got a, a and there, um, Rashida. It's now I've just written it down. It's zero seven five nine four three two five five seven nine. And is that you, Gary? Uh, is it Gary or Garrick? It's no, Gary. it's Gary from the Black Heritage Walk. Yeah. He he's yeah. one of the people in charge of the ball. All right. Okay. Lovely. Thanks. That's, that's um um. What's the name? Um, Marcia's friend. Oh, I've yeah. already emailed Marcia. Yeah, that's so, her friend. That does the Black Heritage Wall. He's yeah. in charge of the ball with Horace Barnes. Yeah, lovely. Thanks very much indeed. I'll give them a call. I've already, as I said, text and emailed uh, Marcia, but I know she's very busy with Charlotte at the moment and uh, organising lots of other things. Right, goody, goody then. Right, so that, that should be all right. Try Gary. And uh, Gary organised uh, a trip to the House of Commons um mm -hmm. last last week that was good fun um uh let's just find it here well not good fun it was a really important day so i'm just saying we now call windrush international allies network put mm -hmm. in the word international june um and went on down to london 
when mm. I went in last year, Gar Gary organised us to go to see Lenny Henry at um, uh, the the Bush Theatre, and we walked through the Houses of Parliament. Mm. Definitely need decolonialising, I tell you. <laughs> there we were, there's me and Gary, <laughs> me <laughs> and Roland, <laughs> looking <laughs> surprised. And it was a fantastic event. These are the rally events that... Uh, um, uh, I'm more interested in getting some of this work into schools because it's our generation, next generation. Um, it that would I be great if we could... I don't know if we could get children going... Uh, schools involved, it would be absolutely hard. London and whether children can go into the House of Commons. This was interesting, though. We discovered, because one of the security guards told us, um, when we told him what we were there for, uh, that um, victory appears to be triumphing over two chained figures that may be enslaved captives. And this is uh, on that golden coach that I, I had the picture up here about on this golden coach. Mm. Well, I know I've been involved, I was involved with a school in Bristol uh, that uh, one changed their name uh, from Colston School to uh, another name. And also when the statue was pulled down. Uh, so I was in, very much involved in that part of Bristol when I was working there for a short period. Well, she do what, what, what's your job at the moment? Uh, I I've have I have been in education most of my life, so I'm sort of semi-retired, and I continue to work with schools on a number of areas like school improvement or inspection. I also work abroad, which is interesting. I work in the UAE doing inspection work there as well. All right. I, That's I... interesting. Very interesting. And you know, in Bristol. With the schools, if you inquire if they still got the Walter Tell School, because Morris, I'm trying to think of his surname, you know, he used to do the Walter Tell School in Bristol. Mm, I can certainly find out. But so it's interesting work that's going on in Bristol because, as you know, Bristol has an incredible history as well uh, in terms of uh, slavery. Um, and uh, the young people in some of the schools uh, are uh, aware in such a way that they were powerful in getting one, getting the name of the school changed, and secondly, uh, to get some of the public places changed where there were figures or monuments uh, which represented slavery. So it's you know these this work goes on, and we pick it up here and there as, as you know like I'll p uh, come and join this group so some incredible work going on but I really do feel very strongly that we're not doing enough in education in curriculum to raise awareness of um, all this and history with young people in schools state schools um, so that's that's my passion. Still an awful lot to learn I'm wondering Rashida um, Birmingham is in reasonable travelling distance of North Wales. Oh, I tra my daughter lives in Wales. She lives in Cardiff. All right. It would be really good to be able... We're working with the National Trust in um, at Penryn Castle, well, the National Trust across North Wales, but Penryn Castle particularly. Um, and it would be really good to get a children, you know, a, a um, an event where children could come to the castle and, and learn the story and see the castle. Um, Absolutely. No, I mean, that'd no, be great. That'd be brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Now, I'm, I'm a member of the National Trust, and when I go around and see some of the paintings, um, you know, there's so much there that we don't know yet. I think we've yet to record some of the things that are still out there, which, uh, which um, uh, represent the representation, uh, continues to be unchallenged. Yes. I'm just going to um, share um, another photograph, um, which is quite uh, quite poignant. Um, in this photograph, you can see mm. uh, this big structure here. This is actually Penryn Castle. Mm. And um, where I've just been staying, uh, Caroline 
um, Caroline's place, which she's giving up now, was um, a rental property on the Penryn estate. This was the view, folks. This was yeah. the view from my bedroom window. What a view. What a view. Oh, beautiful, yes. What? Beautiful. Wow, wow, wow. This is yeah. beautiful, but then there's this horrendous eyesore of a of a folly of a castle <laughs> that was built on on the uh, endeavours of enslaved workers yeah. in Jamaica, in Clarendon. It's just awful when you mm. kind of put the two things together. So mm. many people, locals in the area, refuse to go to Penryn Castle. They won't go because of its history. Protest. <laughs> if we can share with them the history that not only did they go on strike, the quarrymen went on strike against the Penryn Pennant family in uh, 1900. That was a very long and very difficult strike. But also the people in Pennants, the tenants of properties and land in Pennants, Clarendon, also went on strike against Lord Penryn in 1938. And they were extremely successful and by 1940, two years, by 1940, the um, Pennant family had sold all their estates in Jamaica. And that is absolutely remarkable. So I had a really good session a few weeks ago in Black History Conversations talking all about this and, and the um, wonderful Robert Rumble. So, yeah. But the, power of, really, yeah the power of movements. Yes. Yeah. So that was uh, yeah. So for me, it's a bit uh, it's a bit exceptional being back in the UK, <laughs> yes. and catching a nasty UK bug. I've been coughing and spluttering for days doing COVID tests, and I'm all right, I think. But I'm um, sorry, Garrick, if you got whatever I've got. I hope not. Anyway, Excuse me, can I just ask you something quickly, Garrick? Do yeah. you know a Simon Isro from Channel Four reporter? Was he at your parliament? I do know of him. Yes. Okay, because he just interrupted me because I said I'd be mm. finished after five. Yeah. Yeah, I spoke to him earlier. I gave him somebody that he could interview, but he's good, come good. back again. Good. Yeah, he won't. He won't contact. Yeah. 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 So is he okay? He's okay. He's okay. All right then. Yeah, okay. I should tell him that. You gave me the yeah, okay. yeah, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually yeah. um I'm trying to get Channel Four and Channel Five to cover as many of the Windrush seventy five as possible. So I've written to their corporate people. I just want to know what event will they be covering on you know on on the TV. I'll finish with him after this. Shall I tell him to ring you? Yeah? yeah, yeah. Okay, That'll I'll do that. That'll be yeah. good. Yeah. Okay. I yeah. think it'd be good to make a documentary. Yeah, so, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, just on another point, um, Rashida, just a point you mentioned, which I think we should at least try and exploit about school improvement. And one of the one of the conversations, well, several conversations we've had uh, about, you know, the curriculum and 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 so forth, um, you know, is trying to to get um these conversations. Uh, into the curriculum via uh, teachers. And we know that teachers don't feel they have the knowledge and the confidence to do these things. So they need some help. Okay? Mm, yes, um, absolutely. So, you know, if, if there's any way that we can influence the school improvement teams, mm -hmm. um, then that will be excellent because... I did that in Knowsley for five years. I was in charge of school improvement. And we did a lot of good work mm. in the school. Mm. But that was that was specific on the, the Race Amendment Act of 2000, when local authority had to appoint individual to drive those issues through. 
Absolutely. I was one of those advisors mm. to push some of this through. It was uh, sort of um, Stephen Lawrence's inquiry on the yes. back of which we had the recommendations and the Race Relations Amendment Act. And sadly, all those recommendations that were written in the Stephen Lawrence's inquiry were never actually implemented. No. And if you and that's some of the work we're doing in Birmingham. I belong to an organisation called DEEP. And Cecil is on there and Carlton Duncan is on there and I'm on there and a few other people who actually worked in Birmingham during that period. And, we, and, and recently the leader of the council has changed from Tim Ward and it's now John Cotton. And I know John Cotton and I have emailed him in fact today to say I hope that there will be some thought given to diversity inclusion in Birmingham yeah. that was never given. But Birmingham has gone through a very, very challenging period over a number of years and continues to, and black, and I'm talking about politically here, black children have never really ever favored in Birmingham. Mm. And the local authorities never focused on education as such. Uh, we have got the, um, the Birmingham local authority um, uh, uh, have got an organization called Birmingham Education Partnership called BEP, uh, which was given 75.1 million pound uh, to set up um, uh, school improvement for those schools that have not yet academized mm. as a local authority school or, or local authority responsibility. So in a way, uh, the local authority uh, has in some ways abdicated the responsibility uh, in relation to responding to equality and diversity and inclusion in Birmingham because the BEP are not dealing with it either. So we've had a lot of uh, issues in Birmingham, we continue to have those. Mm. We continue to battle on, but there are some uh, some organisations. For example, in Birmingham, which is a private Titan, is a group I also belong to, and they have put on uh, quite a few courses for teachers uh, in relation to equality and inclusion, and they have brought in people who have written books and uh, uh, curriculum development, pastoral development, mm. mental health issues, etc., specifically for children from different backgrounds and bearing in mind Birmingham has now also recently received quite a large population of from Ukraine yeah uh, in terms of asylum seekers and refugees so there's a lot of good things going on uh, in Birmingham but no one really is um, ensuring that education uh, takes on board centrally i mean indigenous schools may be doing a lot of work mm, on mm -hmm. sure but centrally no one really has taken responsibility uh, to ensure that the curriculum and i think that's more a national issue yeah and i think one of the things i've said to charlotte was it's wonderful that um they've got the council behind charlotte and the work that she's been doing in the recommendation education and they have developed and i continue to develop the curriculum but the teach the schools are not going to respond to that readily unless they're going to be inspected so I think we need to get onto the inspection service and I used to be and I continue to be inspector unless you do that the schools are not going to um, ensure that the curriculum is broad and balanced and in yeah. is inclusive yeah. and also that our children uh, in schools are doing equally if uh, in, in schools are doing equally well uh, in terms of academically both at key stage one two three and four and also uh, in terms of post-16 so i mean the, the data shows that they're not doing well exclusion rates are still high yep. there are more, more children from the different backgrounds in special schools than there are ever were before attendant rates are poor we've got the statistics but no one seems to have that drive that pushes the that bit further and i think the only way we could do that as we've got no one at the qca in curriculum development that ofsted who if you look at ofsted framework it's only got one sentence in there at the moment which says uh, and pay a uh, pay attention to the race equality amendment yeah, yeah that yeah. is all and if you look at the reports were well, both in wales and also in england the inspection reports are very bland and very few if any comment on equality inclusion well the problem is bigger than that it's about oh, yes. teachers training you know and you know oh, yes but you, you, got, you got to start there you see no, no, but if there is a requirement nationally, then that will have to be done. 
for example, if Ofsted is going to inspect teacher training providers, which it does, and I've done that, yeah. if they haven't got an inspection criteria in their inspection framework, then no one in in in, in the organization will be delivering on it. Yeah. However, yeah. if the framework said uh, and wrote a paragraph, which you used to do, and I've got the old framework where, I mean, I've been with Ofsted for many years, um, Lots, too many years and there used to be a quite clear criteria re which required teacher training providers fe providers schools mm -hmm. to have in their curriculum uh, uh, and so on uh, but because Ofsted is not going to be inspecting that no one really bothers mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. i mean this is what the conversation i said to charlotte it's great that we've done so much work in wales a curriculum level but unless uh, Estin, which is what equivalent of Ofsted in uh, in in England, unless they have it in their framework, yeah, to inspect schools on those criteria, no one really, and also train the inspectors. Yes, yes. I mean, I was involved with Ofsted when uh, it was mandatory for inspectors to be trained on equality and inclusion, and I led on that program, and that was in '97, and since then nothing has happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we could talk a lot on that, Gary. Oh yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, so, and uh, and I've got all the framework and and etc. and examples of the training because I was the person who was uh, involved with a group of people to develop the training material, which needs mm -hmm. to be updated, and then to deliver the training. But the interesting thing was it was mandatory. Yeah. And if yeah. the inspectors were not trained, then they could not inspect. That's how strong it was back in 95, 96, 97. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those were the days, weren't they? Yeah. But we yeah. need to bring that back. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it's More only so. going to be a political change and direction, but you even wonder whether that will... Yeah, I think I think there is a wave now since uh, Black Lives Matter. There is an incredible opportunity mm. to put pressure on the government to change at the top level, yeah. which will then definitely ensure that schools themselves make change as well. But on the other hand, schools need to have providers who can train them to deliver because some of those people won't be trained because they wouldn't go to the teacher training program where they were supported to develop their thinking and even with the materials. So it's, you know, you've got to start from top and also yes. to yes. It's a two-way process and then meet in the middle. Yeah. I, if I can just say, I, I was an inspector for post-16 and um, I remember one inspection when it was Black History Month. And so I raised the point with the other inspectors that, you know, we need to ensure that this college is paying uh, attention and uh, addressing uh, the opportunities of Black History Month. And the lead inspector said, Black History Month? Yeah, exactly. Exactly, that's why, uh, and this was in the times when CRE existed, Commission for Racial Equality. Yeah. And since we lost uh, CRE, I think things have slowly gone backwards uh, because there isn't a body of people uh, who have got that intellectual um, background who can challenge uh, another intellectual body, which is education. And I think that was the saddest loss when uh, CRE was amalgamated into the Equality Division, yeah, which yeah. became almost like a melting Hot, really. I'm sorry, I'm not being negative. But no, 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 you're absolutely right. I'd, absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to show you something else that I found last week. I don't know if you've seen about this, uh, Garrick, or anyone else. Um, this is the um, School of Advanced Study at the University of London. Um, the Windrush Scandal in a Transnational and Commonwealth Conference. It's the 19th of June. Have you seen about it? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to that one. Um... Oh, good. Yeah, good. yeah. I'm going to. Mm. Good. I didn't. Uh, mm. Yeah, I was invited. That's um, Juanita. But I'm, yes. I've been, yes. I've been I'm, I'm, I'm New Yorker. Yeah, myself, myself, and Roland um will be attending. Mm. All right, that's mm. great, mm. great, great, great. All right. Well, this must be the most epic Black History conversation <clears throat> we've ever had. Um, usually. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me, Rashida. Yes. Yeah, sorry, June. Um, so, 
I just had to put some peanuts in. I felt a bit funny, you know, apart <laughs> from my diabetes food. Um, Liz, yeah, my, uh, are you going to that um, trans that um, kind of yeah. No, I'm not, I didn't know anything about it. I'll be quite honest. What happened, um, Dr. Cox, Juanita said that originally it was £60. Yeah. She, she was on here last week, wasn't she? She was, yeah, yeah. So now it's not, now it's open to everyone. Yeah, it's what free, it's free you? now. Free yeah, it would be yeah. nice if you could go, you know. I'd like to, if somebody could send me the details. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Garrick? Yeah, yeah, I could do that. Yeah. Liz, send it to Liz and let Liz yeah. send it to yeah. Rashida. Yeah, yeah. That would be yeah. lovely if you could go. I, am, I tell you, I get quite passionate about education. <laughs> mm -hmm. I do get very passionate about education and, I, I, and my frustration comes through quite strongly because yeah. one of the things that are group, there are people who have got an educational background and knowledge and understanding and when those people, those people speak up, other people on the receiving end get very challenged and get quite quite um, mm, mm. tight about it uh, because it's it's I think it's a generation that can speak back uh, yeah. talking the same language which some people find quite difficult. Yeah. Right. Sorry, I missed that bit. Um... Uh, Lisa, they were going to say uh, they asked if I would go to that conference on the right, institute. Okay, that would be lovely. I'll do my best to go. And uh, um... if you can send me the details, that'd be really helpful because I didn't get to the details. You know what would be lovely to save me looking up on my endless long mailing list. Liz, can you give me your email address again? I can email it to you, or I can put it. Uh, right, well, my in email. The... My email address. Oh, is... I've got it. I've got your email. If I put. Uh, I'll just put uh, Rashida and I'll put my email so you know who it's from. So then I'll send you all the information about what we've okay. been talking about. Well, and then, you. have you got Juanita's details to give Rashida? Yes, because Juanita was on last week, so Liz has got yeah. the details, yeah. Mm. Yeah, lovely. Mm. So I'll just okay. put my there, Rashida, rsh19 at me.com. It's a very simple one to remember. Mm. That's good. Nice and easy. Mm. I've registered on on your you know website, yeah. so yeah. you can get it next time. Yeah, yeah. I'm so sorry. I didn't know this uh, this group. I haven't been able to come before because I'm involved with uh, a brig, which is Birmingham Race Equality Group in Birmingham. I'm also involved with Deep, uh, which is as I said, a group of people like um, Marcia attends that occasionally, and there's um. Uh, it's got John. John involved. Gus John has been involved in the past, but he hasn't been able to come for some time. So it's quite a few groups. Went along once. They want to. De it's all about decolonizing. De decolonizing the curriculum is what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. uh, but sadly, um, you know, people have uh, lives are so very busy. Mm -hmm. But it's very much uh, looking at education from a perspective of uh, what has happened, what needs to happen rather than just saying what needs to happen because there's so much that has happened and there's so many documentation recommendations like the Stephen Lawrence's inquiry, like the other uh, reports that written, Brampton Report and so on. And all those incredibly powerful recommendations were never really put into pr practice. And what we're saying is do the job that you should have done and a bit more now. And uh, that's what we're trying to do at the moment. Well, um, I think that's wonderful, and um, there's just so so much to be done. What we did with these sessions, Rashida, we just started sharing community research mm -hmm. went back over a hundred sessions ago. Now we started in wow. the first Black History Month when we were in COVID. We couldn't mm -hmm. run our usual. Um, mm -hmm. The organisation I'm involved is called Learning Links International. Um, we couldn't run our conference at Black History Month so we decided to split it over five sessions on the Fridays of, of Black History Month and uh, we looked at uh, um, a project each time and we've just kept on going and we now call it seasons and we do it like each term and then um, this season we're just looking predominantly at the Windrush stories because it's such an important anniversary but mm. then we 
people network and talk between one another in the sessions and they're quite informal and we do publish them online but not many people are looking at them and we most often have a speaker or two I try and learn my lesson of not having two speakers but when you have one speaker and that speaker doesn't turn up or can't connect mm. then you're stuffed <laughs> like this and then the conversation bit is just really just as important and mm. and to, to catch up with what's going on so i really appreciate all you're doing i really appreciate the fact that it isn't three o'clock in the morning but normally... <laughs> yeah australian talk it says and uk it is. time, it is time. It is. i know we're gonna go but just mention to but Liz, I've, I've about... got to go in a moment because yeah. I've got a CLP meeting, yeah. which is uh, the Labour meeting at 7.30, and I want to have something to eat before that, uh, prepare for that meeting, because I'm chairing that one, meeting. Uh, one second, Gary. Mm. I just say, just tell Rashida in, in half a minute yes. about last year this time we've done a, like a, a kind of series or project on trauma Yes. And we had Dr. Hillary in Jamaica. Yes. Facilitating. It was fantastic, you know. Yes. Yeah. Um, that was one of our international highlights mm. um, because that was based on uh, the work that um, Dr. Hillary husband uh, had done for many years. Um, in Birmingham. <laughs> yes. Train, train in Birmingham. Yes. Um, uh, Fred... Fred uh, Ickling, Dr. Fred Ickling. And um, when, when we started to look at the intergenerational trauma mm. um, uh, across Windrush, um, it's not just about Windrush. It's also the trauma that has come out of the last 500 years, mm -hmm. generation after generation after generation. Mm -hmm. and so you know we were privileged that she was able to um how many session did we have liz with um... about six in it yes yeah. six or eight something like that yeah eight, eight or so i think it was yeah it, and, we, uh, it was brilliant yeah. and now you're yeah, lovely it now was. um um professor martin leave um livermore as as connected with hillary in jamaica um, as a result of the Windrush anniversary 75. So, you know, they're having conversation, um, you know, at the University of the West Indies. So, again, it just go to show about these conversation that we have and where these conversation can go and how, how these conversation can connect to other conversation. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, the network that we, we've developed, you know, it is an international network, and that's precisely what it is. That is mm -hmm. why we're now international allied network rather than Windrush International Windrush International Allied Windrush network. International oh. Allied Network. That, that's where we are at this moment, purely because of our connection that we have made outside globally, the UK, globally. not just in Jamaica. Globally, in, you know, in Africa and other parts, we've made Canada, those connections. And Poland. yes, that has allowed us to build, you know, build some relationship and some trust, you mm. know, with, with people. Um, and again, we wouldn't have done that if, you know, if Liz didn't start these conversation mm. on, on Zoom, we wouldn't have we wouldn't we wouldn't have had the opportunity of doing that. Mm. Mm. So the Zoom platform has worked wonders for us mm, that's and I'm very grateful that um you've been so supportive and i really mean that it's been just brilliant because can't be me twittering away on my own yeah and 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 uh, <laughs> june elizabeth yeah. i want to say tell you something now that um you might want to think about um liz and i had a conversation this week while i was over in north wales and I suggested to Liz that she should be recorded. We need to record a session with Liz to tell us how this started. Good idea. 
yeah, so that we have the that history, documented. Because we've got everything else with you yeah. know Liz cheering, etc. But we yeah. need that focal point to record yes. how this up, and then all the other conversation will make sense. Absolutely. Yes. So maybe we can, me, and you can interview Liz. Yes. Yes. And we put our questions so that yes we get everything out of Liz. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yes, absolutely, idea. absolutely. Mm. And that will be idea. the history mm. of the beginning. Yes, 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 yes. exactly. Oh, exactly. Well, I, what do you think, please? After about 50 sessions, I, I did an analysis, and it must be on a PowerPoint somewhere. I did an analysis of who had, who had spoken. Mm. Because the other thing is that we've now got this incredible resource. Yes, yes. Of people who who talk about all kinds of different aspects of black history and we want to kind of make it useful mm. that's our main thinking anyway yeah 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 um we'll come back on that yeah 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 I think working we might progress let you go now gary can i think i'm back to go because i got to yes that yes idea. sure Really, man, I'll tell you. Oh, good luck on the wedding tomorrow liz you're going to the wedding aren't you oh, lovely. Enjoy <laughs> yourself. so enjoy and, and no. say hi to caroline no. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you again soon. And okay. Talk All right. All right. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.